This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. It's a bright blue sky and very, very hot here at Juma Game Reserve, but thankfully there is also a wind that is keeping things cool. This is Safari Live. Ready. Good afternoon fellow safarians and welcome to the largest game drive vehicle in the world. It is a beautiful afternoon, like I say there's a bit of a breeze blowing but there is not a single cloud in the sky. Now my name is Tristan, on camera today I've got a VM the Wildebeest and it promises to be a good afternoon with clear weather like this and, and nice bright sunshine. Hopefully we'll find a lot of animals coming down to the water holes to drink and it should be a busy day ahead. Now remember it is live, it is interactive which means that you can get hold of us on hashtag safari live on Twitter or on the YouTube chat if you want to ask any questions or if you just want to say hello from wherever you may be watching. Now we are going to try and meander our way around waterholes given that it is quite warm this afternoon. There is a breeze blowing and the breeze is quite nice when you're in the shade but when you're like William and I sitting in the sun like we are now it is quite warm out here so we're going to check some of the waterholes. Hopefully there will be some sign of some elephants. I've really missed seeing Ellie's and I'm hoping that they are going to start meandering their way back given that it's been quite dry over the last few days and and hot and that hopefully will mean that we're going to get a situation where the yellows are going to come down to the bigger water sources and try and utilize those to cool down as well as just to gain vital moisture. Failing all of that of course as the day gets a little bit later so our cat should come out and I know Hosanna was found somewhere around Bifelzuk Dam this morning and he was left going west. Now west from Bifelzuk Dam is not an easy place to look around so we are going to try with Gauri being down I don't know if we're going to get signal but we will head up into that general vicinity if we can a little bit later and just see maybe we get lucky and there's some sort of sign of Hosanna maybe he's come a bit further south where we do have signal and, and hopefully we'll be a bit lucky so that's the kind of plan for the afternoon also won't say no to Janet Jackson but no Janet Jackson is not at home so there's Janet Jackson's home still evacuated again maybe on her summer holiday and is taking it very easy we haven't seen her since I've been back or him like I say I'm not sure if it's a male or a female and so I wonder if it's maybe found itself an alternative residence for the summertime now I'm not quite sure what's been happening on Chitwa as well. I want to try and see if we can get hold of somebody and get some updates from that side. I know Tumba and Kuchava have been getting seen every now and then but I'm not sure whether that's on Chitwa or in Nets or in Koro and need to just try and find out exactly where they have been seen. So that might head that way. It's also the dam is always productive in weather like this. It might be a bit breezy so we'll wait until around sunset if we do go to the dam because it's generally the wind then calms down and it's a lot nicer to be able to go and sit at the dam and watch all the hippos and hopefully other animals that are drinking. Now this afternoon at the moment it's just going to be me because the Masai Mara is being pelted once again by a raging torrent of water that is falling from the sky and therefore the internet is not working. So they will hopefully join us a little bit later as things clear up. I believe Alex the genius is on it and is busy working out how to get them back up and running. So hopefully we will see the Mara team a little bit later but just for now it's going to be all Sabi Sands and all Juma which is nothing wrong with that it's always a wonderful thing just to drive around with you guys and take in all the beauty and sights and sounds that is Juma at the moment and actually it's really nice just driving around it's so beautiful with all this green starting to come through it feels like there's life starting to come out everywhere. and so it makes for a far more kind of interesting drive than what we've been having over the last few months is start to notice little buds of flowers and start to see new birds that you haven't seen for a while all these kind of things keep you intrigued the whole way along as we go so hopefully all of you at home will be the same and have the same feeling as we do this now our torchwood is looking as difficult as ever it's the 
tree that kind of it kept its leaves but this is one of my favorite torchwoods and I'll always remember this torchwood because this torchwood is actually ah oh, funny enough in the torchwood before we get on to my story BM you see the tree agama on the trunk so just below where the branches start it's about I would say just towards the top okay so VM's got it there's a beautiful lizard that we're seeing on the tree and these guys we don't see them that often that's the male tree agama and look at the colors on that individual so he's got this bright blue head and these yellow and greens that come down from there and that's to try and signify to the female that he's ready and he can mate and that he's an impressive individual but how cool is that lizard it's one of the more brightly colored in individuals that we see out here and I was talking about how as we're starting to go into the summer months so we start to see a lot more life coming out and these guys would have been fairly sort of dull and drab and would have had the coloration of bark and would have tried to have blended in through the winter months also because it's cooler they would have spent a lot of time hidden so that because they can't move very fast and that would then make them susceptible to being preyed upon now that it's warmer though their blood can warm up quickly and they can be fairly active and it's now time to mate and display those colors and show those females just how good they look and look at the coloration around the head isn't that magnificent it's electric electric blue and as the sun is shimmering over it through the sort of dappled light you can see how it reflects that light and just becomes that much more vibrant as the sun hits it so he's really a striking looking fella and I'm sure there will be some ladies that will most certainly look for him and be impressed by his beauty now Umka and many others that are commenting it's just how wonderful he is and how beautiful he is and he keeps so just like I was saying, the females are all quite attracted to him, even us as humans, we think that he looks rather dapper with all of his beautiful coloration. Now, you will find that these tree agamas, as the name suggests, spend predominantly all their life around trees. They will come down and they will cross to other trees, but most of their life is spent in these big, tall trees where they can use the crevices and the cracks and little holes in the tree to try and hide away and to try and get out of the way of predators. But you will find them sometimes coming down and scampering around. There is another male that looks like that I've seen recently quite a bit on quarantine so there are quite a few of them and they are dotted around where you've got big trees like this it's often worthwhile just stopping and looking and really kind of taking in what's going on and you can often then spot these blue heads kind of poking out somewhere on the tree if the female's around she's going to be much harder to spot she's mottled kind of grays and browns and she blends in incredibly well with the tree itself and it will be very difficult to be able to see her but that's absolutely wonderful. That was a nice surprise. I didn't expect that at all. I was actually commenting on how this torchwood is a tree that I always remember and always reminds me of Shongile. Now, I know a lot of you have been asking about Shongile and where she is and what's going on and what I think she could have happened to her. Well, I honestly don't know. I don't know where she is. I don't know if anybody's seen her. There's no new updates on it. And so we'll just have to wait and see how that all plays out. But it was one of the first sightings I ever had of Shongile when I started at Safari Live was sitting in this tree on one of these big branches. In fact, this big branch at Bows to the left so she was sitting on top there and we spent the afternoon with her she kind of gazed upon the scenery and it was just a wonderful sighting of the little princess right well we're going to leave our lizard because he's scuttled off into a crevice in the tree and so we're going to try and check around twin dams now and just see if there isn't any sign of something that's been lurking even some tracks that we can work with hopefully there's some ellie tracks that have been somewhere in this area that we can try and get onto those and try and follow them. I also want to just follow the course of the Mulawati because in warmer weather like this, it's got lots of shady air, which is ideal for a lot of the animals. What's that, Vildi? I thought William said something, but he didn't. Oh, Linda, you're asking about Puji. We haven't seen Puji for a while. Well, Puji's taking it easy. Puji's at home at the moment. So Puji's just taking a bit of a rest and not being bounced around with Byron and I swapping cars every drive almost. It's been difficult to keep Puji around. I keep forgetting him on different cars. So I've left him at home for a few days, but I promise that I'll bring him tomorrow morning so that he can say hello to all of you. So I'll bring him out on our sunrise safari. Now, what I've spotted from here is also quite nice. It's another indication of summer and spring approaching. So just on a small termite mound here, we have a tiny little plant growing and there's a bright red coloration just on the edge of the plant now this is a dwarf burr bean and there is its flowers that are slowly but surely coming out so it's another little summer sort of sign and we obviously don't see too many flowers at the moment because it's still early springy summertime and there's not 
that many that have gotten enough water to start flowering but the boa beans are always the first ones now I don't know if you noticed there were quite a number of insects there so what I might do is I might just reposition ourselves quickly so we can get a little bit closer so we can actually see what beetles and bugs are feeding on the flower itself now I did see some polyrachis ants there but let's try and go a little bit closer and actually just check what we've got feeding on hopefully they won't run away or fly away as insects do they don't really run a lot of them except for the ants but much easier on a bush we'll go and do all of these things but our gari repeater still playing up it's causing a bit of havoc with bushwalk and the camera pack and so that's why we haven't done any i'm really looking forward to actually getting out on foot over the next little bit to see so there we go you can see all of the polyrachis ants that are on there and they all busy feeding off the nectar and so that's what's there i thought there might be a couple beetles in here but it's all just the big dark black ants that we call polyrachis that are enjoying a bit of nectar and a bit of sweetness and are really probably loving the fact that they can get quite a bit of sugar out of these beautiful little red flowers but isn't that pretty we've had a really wonderful start to our drive it's maybe not the bigger things but certainly a lot of beauty in the things that we have seen so far this afternoon from the tree agama with his bright electric blue head to the bright red flowers of the dwarf boar bean it's all very very nice i wonder what else is in store for us today So, Francis from Israel, you say it's amazing how green it's gotten here so quickly. Well, it is. It's an incredible transformation that happens. And what's interesting is if you've been watching for a few months, as I know you have been, you will know that we've had a bit of rain outside of this rain that we had recently. But the temperatures were too cold to promote growth. Now that we've got warm temperatures, coloration see on my right hand side here there's a lot of green that is coming out of the grass at the moment there's a few of these um, white berry bushes that have got uh, flowers at, I mean leaves on them as well so it's all getting quite bright and green at the moment so there we go there's bright luscious little leaves that have grown there's also another flower that we've got over here so there is another little bright purple flower that you see so it's another one of our summer plants and that is a poison apple that you're seeing over there so they do get this little purple flower and then they'll get an almost apple like growth that'll come out and so you see them quite a bit and you find them generally in quite disturbed areas where there's a lot of foot traffic and so quarantine we see them a lot and here around twin dams where there's a lot of movement of of elephants and all kinds of other things that disturbs the layer of soil and also is overgrazed quite a bit then those grow there but alas, no interesting little birds. I thought maybe now with the flooding of this area down below Twin Dams that we might have seen a lot more birds coming in. My World, Your Music, you're asking if sugar is found in all of the plants. Well, there are sugars in most of them. So a lot of the cells that compromise, well, that make up plants contain sugars. Some of them will be higher in sugar content than others, but most of the cellulose and, and, and cells within the actual plant itself will contain some sugars. And so that's why most of these animals will feed off various different flowers in particular. Flowers have nectar, and nectar is a sugary-based um, material and so a lot of insects and birds now what we do have will if I can ask you just to show is our little terrapin friends that are swimming in the water themselves they're being blown about a bit by the wind so there you go they're having to deal with a few waves that are coming along but there is our terrapins and they're just bobbing about I'm sure a lot of them would have spent time on the banks today and warmed up and now it's gotten a little hot for them so they've gone into the water just to cool off and as Megan says doing a little bit of body surfing now Megan did you body surf Megan's from Cape Town so in Cape Town they're obviously right on the coastline and so <laughs> and so <laughs> there is an ocean which means that I'm sure Megan has done some body surfing and she's now telling me in my ear that she is the best body surfer that there is Megan I feel like your leave which is coming up fairly shortly you're going to actually have to prove this theory so what we're gonna to have to ask Megan to do is when she goes on leave is to produce a video of her body surfing you're going to have to find someone to film it Megan and so you can prove the theory because otherwise it's just a theory and we can't have factless 
or baseless information out here. Your GoPro is ready, do you? Okay. Which will be into the Mara. So I'll have to tell Taylor and the rest to be able to get hold of that footage and show all of us just how good Megan is at body surfing. I reckon, Megan, you're going to have some competition. I'm pretty sure Scott would probably get involved in that competition. Who else is into the ocean and all of those kind of things? Well, Brent, we know, will never, never, ever back down from a challenge, and neither will Taylor. So I'm pretty sure that they would get involved in the body surfing challenge too. I uh, saw something running over there. I just want to just check with my binos what it was. It might have been like a little diker or something like that. That's what it seemed like. Mm, I can't see anything. Vim, can you see anything? Did you see what it was, Vim? Yeah. No, Vim didn't see either, but there was definitely something that ran. Let's go and take a little turn past there and just double check. I think it's going to be better if we just go back a little bit. B. Wilson, you're asking, is it too early for bees? No, so we do have bees around already. Um, I've seen, where did I see bees the other day? I definitely saw bees somewhere and I can't remember for the life of me where it was. I can't remember if it was at Inga's or if it was at DRC, there was quite a few of them around. I don't know, my brain's failing me at the moment, but I, I remember seeing bees somewhere. And so, yes, they are around, they'll be fairly active now that the flowers are starting to come out and producing pollen. So we're gonna see a situation where a lot of the bees are going to come out and start feeding off them. So yes, there are bees around. I wonder what ran here. I'm sure I saw an animal. I can't see anything now. Was it a monkey, Vildi? Oh, uh, so Viam can see a monkey that it was apparently hiding from us. So there's a vivid monkey. There it is, just behind. So I'm not completely crazy, but it's strange to see a young monkey. That's not a very old monkey. It's, you can see, still got quite a young face, and it's not very big, hiding away by itself. I would have thought that we would have seen other monkeys somewhere in this general vicinity, because generally vervets are not loners. They are sociable group animals. And so it's quite strange to see one lone youngish monkey by itself. Maybe the rest of them are somewhere in these jackalberries feeding off the jackalberry fruit. Although there won't be too many jackalberry fruits left now. Most of those probably would have been dropped and actually fed off. So we're going to leave our little vervet because he's obviously a little bit scared of our presence. And I don't want to get between it and its family and stress it out. So we're going to let it just try and find whoever it's looking for and regroup with everybody. Alan, I have not actually tasted wild honey from the reserve. It's not something that is harvested out here. So remember that in this particular section, we have a situation where or in this reserve is that we try and leave things as much as possible now harvesting honey from a hive is quite invasive and quite damaging it's almost like us going into a hyena den and breaking half of it open just to try and see what's going on inside there so we try and leave the bees to themselves they've got enough problems to deal with in the world at the moment so many different bees that are being um, pushed out and killed and and they, their numbers are really plummeting so for us to go and harvest honey from bees that are out here in the wild is not really that ethical and, and not something that we should be doing the thing is though is that there are areas outside of the reserves that do have bees that will travel probably between the reserves and where they are based and will feed off a lot of the local indigenous vegetation particularly acacias so acacia honey is quite a big thing in South Africa you do find a lot of beekeepers will plant acacias nearby their hives and so that those bees can feed off the nectar of the acacia flowers so you do find acacia honey and I have tried that I'm not a huge honey fan actually to be honest but I know that a lot of the other guys do like the acacia honey so apparently it's is very very tasty now the reason why I've stopped here is because from this distance is probably the best angle that I can get on the Wahlberg's eagle nest and I can see that there's a Wahlberg's eagle's head poking out so it's that tree over there Bildi. yeah so I think there's a Wahlberg's eagle sitting on top there so there we go you can just see the white head of the pale form Wahlberg's as it sits and probably is incubating its eggs now I'd imagine that these Wahlberg's have already bred the fact that this bird is sitting on a nest in this heat would indicate that there are eggs present there and she's already laid so it's going to be nice just to monitor that nest it is a nest that we see very regularly and so really good to see that the pale form is back on this nest and is actually 
finished because the last time I saw her which was about I would say about two weeks ago she was still building or he was still building they were adding sticks to it so they must have laid now and are actually incubating eggs although I would imagine in sun like this she's more actually just protecting them from the vast well the vicious sun and making sure that they're actually not being cooked rather than actually trying to keep them warm right let's see what else there is out here it's a productive little section this it's been nice to drive around twin dams while there's been no major animals there's lots of birds and insects and lots to talk about really which is quite nice hopefully the rest of our drive will continue to go like this we'll be able to find lots of different things Love mine, the butterflies are starting slowly but surely to appear. I think we need a little bit more rain before we start to see more of them. But yes, they are starting to appear. So I've seen um, quite a few monarchs recently, African monarchs. There's a lot of um, pearl emperors or Shiraxes varnes is their scientific name, which is a beautiful white butterfly with brown wing edgings to it. So there's been quite a few of them that I've seen flying around, but th there's been one or two um, common vagrants, but I haven't seen any brown veined whites yet. I haven't seen any of the little common blues or any of those or creas. So I think they will come a little bit later when we start to get a bit more rain. We just need a little bit more vegetation and for the grass to grow and start to seed and produce that gummy sap and, and flowers to come out a little bit more than what we're seeing now and then hopefully we'll start to see a lot more butterflies coming out. I know Brent is absolutely besotted with butterflies and I really like them too. I love trying to ID different butterflies and look for them. I'm not that good at it and I don't know all the butterflies but I certainly have learned a lot over the last few years and have, have done a lot to try and actually learn about butterflies. Now there's some leopard tracks here and I want to just find out from Viem if these leopard tracks are from this morning because this looks like a female leopard that's crossed here during the day because it's on top of all the vehicle tracks. Viem, did you drive here this morning? So if you have a look there, very clear as day in the tracks of the vehicles is some leopard paw prints and that is for a female leopard and I would imagine this must be for Tandi. So what I want to do is just check the Mulawati because this is going straight into the Mulawati. It's a route that she walks regularly and so I do want to just check this and make 100% sure. But that's exciting news. These tracks look really nice. I like the look of these tracks. They don't look too windswept, nice and smooth. And so hopefully we'll be able to find this individual. I see she turned up the road here as well. Now I wonder if somebody didn't track these. I just want to double check. There's tracks going back and forth here. I think maybe the Mulawati is not a bad place actually just to have a double check. She might be lying in the shade somewhere here. There's also from where we are now, if she crossed over and went straight across, there's a little water hole there that's not often checked by anybody. It's not really a road that goes there. So I might just go and check that water hole. Just check if she's not lying somewhere close to that. In a hot weather like this, you would expect our leopards to head towards watery areas. So I'm going to just double check there. But those tracks look really good and really fresh. So hopefully there is a spotted cat lurking somewhere close by here to explain why we haven't seen any signs of antelope species Rita you want to know how I can tell that it's a female leopard well there's a number of reasons. One is just the sheer size of it. So when you have a leopard track, a male leopard will have a much bigger, bulkier track. A female tends to have a very small, slender, narrow track. Her front foot is a little bit more rounded and her back foot will be very oval in shape. Whereas a male's, his tend to be almost perfect circular shape. So if you had to draw a circle around it, it would be a perfect circle. Whereas the females generally have a little bit more of an oval shape to theirs. The other thing is with a male leopard track is where the two lobes are so if you've got one two three lobes at the back these back two lobes on a male are very rounded they almost form a shape like that whereas a female's back lobe if I use my finger has a more kind of that's probably not a good way to do it let's use two fingers has that kind of shape to the back of the track it's more angular and so that's how we can tell the difference between the females and the males and then again just size is a big thing all right so 
the young males that we have in this area at the moment, the you know Hosanas, Tumbas, they already have feet much bigger than a female and much more bulky than what a female is. So I'm pretty sure that that's a track for either Tundi or Shadow. Given where it is on Twin Dams Road, I'm almost 99% sure that that's Tundi's tracks crossing over there. Now the reason why I stopped here was also because of a lilac breasted roller, which I see I've chased off when my mic pack fell out of my vehicle and hit the side of the car. So unfortunately that's disappeared. But let me just double check down towards the Mulawati drainage system. I know Tundi absolutely loves walking around in here. She's tough to find a lot of the time because she rests in thickets and is very seldom right out in the open. But maybe, just maybe, she's lurking in some of the shade somewhere around here and we'll be able to spot her underneath all of this. Of course, because it's just me at the moment, I can't really do too much tracking. So I can't get off the car and try and kind of look around for tracks. The best I can do is just try and drive and, and look very carefully as I'm driving to try and spot them in the tracks of, of the cars or, or in the Mulawati or actually just physically spot Tundi lying somewhere or what, whichever leopard it is that is around here. But I don't see any tracks crossing over this section. So I'm going to go and check that water hole that I was talking about just now. It's just a small little puddle basically, but it's the perfect place for a leopard to drink. We know that leopards ideally like to drink out of smaller water sources than larger ones if they can avoid drinking out of somewhere like twin dams they would prefer to drink out of these more isolated smaller pockets of water because it's a lot safer for them there's not a threat of crocodiles and various other things so it's going to be worth just checking and double checking here i mean we've got nothing to lose we might get lucky and find her there or we don't get any luck and there's well nothing around and it'll just be pretty to go and drive there it's somewhere we don't drive very often and so I'm just also just checking the road as I go. So the important thing when trying to track from a vehicle as opposed to being on foot, on foot you can follow track for track. On a vehicle you're going to lose the track a lot of the time because they're going to veer off the road and they're going to cut through places that you would generally just follow on foot. So with a vehicle it's always important to just try and pull off the road and drive more on the shoulder of the road. And uh, no, those birds have flown away. There were some southern black tits above me that flew away. And so it's better to try and middle and the left and watch this right track and try and see if you can find a footprint crossing or walking down the road and that's the easiest way to be able to look for footprints when driving a vehicle also what you try and do is from the position that we're in now is you've got to try and look at the tread pattern of a vehicle and kind of get that tread pattern and then try and see if there's any breaks in that tread pattern and that will then indicate okay there's some disturbance there and then you stop next to it and you can look really closely and maybe you'll find that track then going through that area I didn't do it. You're asking when I'm out and about tracking, have I had an animal startle me? Oh, many times. Far too many times to actually remember all of them. But I've had lions startle me, leopards startle me, buffalo, elephant, rhino, um, warthogs. And you'll laugh at me because I say warthogs and I group them in with all of these big nasty animals that we know are very <laughs> dangerous. But warthogs have probably given me more frights than most other animals because often you'll come around the corner and all of a sudden there'll be a warthog and it'll just run for its life because it's also absolutely petrified of you. And it ends up running in a direction and you kind of just get your heart goes at a million miles an hour because you're now following tracks for some dangerous animal whether it be lion or leopard or whatever it is that you're following and all of a sudden there's this burst and this noise and or you see something running and you can't your brain is a little slow to kind of comprehend exactly what's going on so I've been given frights by them many times many Franklins funny enough because they come squawking out and busting out towards you and it's just flapping of feathers and noise which is not very pleasant but yeah pretty much all the animals have given me some sort of a fright at some point and the thing is is just to remain composed and to remain sort of aware of what's going on around you and to try and not get a fright and, and panic it's rather just to assess what's going on as quick as you can and sort it out from there and so that's why it's it's, it's good to go on walks with experienced people a number of times to be able to then learn how to deal with certain situations now this is the little water point that i was talking about a little bit earlier it's a nice little secluded hidden kind of muddy wallow and and the perfect place 
for a number of our cats to come and drink. You can see it's slightly bigger than a lot of the other puddles. There's actually a number of red-billed quellias that are up here at the moment, just on the top right of that tree. You can see there they're all is it red-billed quellias? Or, yes, red-billed quellias. So they've all come down for a bit of a drink and because it's a quiet pan and not too much goes on here, you'll often find a lot of different birds and and um, lizards and butterflies and, and those kind of things as well as leopard. I've found a number of leopard tracks here on bush walks over the time that I've been here and, and a plate when I've been tracking I've walked past here a few times and found that a number of our cats actually do like to come into this area. So it's a, it's a wonderful place just to come and check and have a look and Herbie actually showed me this. He Once I was tracking Hosanna and he told me that this is a place that I must always come and check because if the animals aren't at Twin Dams this is the next place that they come to drink particularly in the summer months. So it's worthwhile to check here. I can see that there's nothing really lying under the shade and so we're probably going to turn around and go back towards the Mulawati and follow the Mulawati up to Chelapan and check that water point. If there's nothing there with those tracks, well then I'm going to try and see what else there is. I also want to try and get an update just on the radio because I haven't actually oh sorry little red-billed quellias I have just unfortunately just given my red-billed quellias a massive fright Right, well, I'm going to just turn around and start heading back towards Mulawati, as I said, and I'm going to try and get an update on the radio. And while I do that, just to give us a little break, we're going to go back to, well, probably one of the best sightings I've had in a long time, and that was of our three male leopards making friends. What you're seeing here is just absolutely insane. To have three males like this together is almost unheard of and the fact that Tingana is so relaxed with them Hosanna doesn't seem too perturbed Tamba up in the tree is not too worried I've never seen three leopards in close proximity like this feeding off carcasses with a big male being the one that allows them to feed it really is a very very strange dynamic this and not something we're gonna see every day you can see Tamba's just having a field day I think he's got the best spot out of all of them at the moment maybe <laughs> Tingana is just a bit perplexed at that his two offspring from different parents are sitting in the same area and everything is a bit weird for him. Maybe that's why he's a bit concerned or I don't know. It's just such a strange, strange thing. There is a scavenger as well that is slowly making its way towards where Tingana is. So there you can see the hyenas have arrived. There's two of them as well as the three leopards so it's all going a bit chaotic now that hyena is going straight to where Hosanna had his leg there we go and Hosanna wouldn't have been able to crunch that down but a hyena most definitely can and there goes a hyena trotting off with its prize in the form of a carcass or in the form of a leg now you see look how he's crouching down waiting for the hyena to go past once hyena has gone past he pops back up again exactly the same behavior that Tingana displayed how cool is this? Like I say, so we didn't have leopards for a few days, but we're more than making up for it now by having a whole bunch of them all together. Now, wasn't that a wonderful sighting? It's so, so crazy to think that those three boys are always so tolerant of each other, particularly around food. It absolutely amazes me at how Tingana's behavior was there. We, you know, he often gets this bad reputation of being this horrible leopard that, you know, he killed Shaluva and that he's chased other leopards and he steals and everybody kind of vilifies Tingana a lot of the time. And you can see there that actually he was probably the most relaxed of all three of them. Now, right at the end of the sighting, I thought he was actually chasing Tumba away when Tumba came down the tree and he was trotting after them but that's not actually what happened. Later I managed to speak to um, some of the other guides who were positioned a little bit differently to what we were and what they told me was that when Tumba came down the tree it was actually Hosanna that came running after Tumba. Now the commotion of the two of them running behind each other is what triggered Tingana to go trotting behind them and when we saw a visual of Tingana chasing behind Tumba well, what I thought was Tumba was actually Hosanna that he was behind. And then he sent marks and he just kind of showed the boys, listen, you guys can have your little sort of altercation, but this ultimately is my area. And so all of you just back off. This is where I stay and where I live. So it was really quite amazing. I, I really didn't expect that from Tingana. I would have thought Tingana would have been a lot more aggressive towards those two, particularly with food. Had there not been food, maybe a little bit of a different situation. And I would have been a little bit more kind of aware that he might have been okay with them. But the fact that they both the boys were eating and he wasn't perturbed was just absolutely unbelievable and one of those once in a lifetime kind of sightings it's not very often that you're going to get to see something like that I certainly don't think I will probably see all three males in a sighting as relaxed as that again in my time so well you never know maybe I will but 
it's a very special thing. It's certainly a first for me to see such relaxed behavior from a dominant male leopard like carcass with other leopards in the area. Now, unfortunately, I can't really drive the Mulawati because the reception in the Mulawati is going to go up and down and cut and go all over the place. And so, while we don't have the Mara with us, I'm going to have to keep the Mulawati for a little bit later. And, and I know the tracks do head off into the Mulawati, but we're going to just have to try and hope that this leopard decided just to lie on somewhere where I can actually see from here. And hopefully it's not in deep inside where we're going to lose reception. So, I do apologize. And if you're wondering why I'm not continuing with it trying to track those tracks is not really much more I can do until the Mara comes back online and hopefully they will come back online at some point otherwise well it is what it is and we'll just drive around this area and hope for the best and maybe later in the day this particular individual does start moving and what I want to do quickly now is just go and check pangolin tracks waterhole check Chelapan, and then I'm gonna come down to Spaghetti Junction and start heading northwards towards where Hosanna was this morning try and see if maybe he's been walking around a little bit as well and also just keep an eye out for Tandy or any of the others Lana, who's 14 years old and is asking a question well beyond her years and it's a very very pertinent question and a very good question to ask and Lana wants to know basically with so many of the leopards here around Juma being Karula's offspring or at least related to Karula in some way is that not going to cause a problem genetically with our leopards here because of how many of them are related well Ilana no probably not and the reason why I say that is because Tingana is a male from a different area altogether he is not a individual that was born into the Karula bloodline and genetics and so therefore he's got a very sort of different genetic code that's being mixed in with Karula that's produced these offspring now if let's say hypothetically um, Shongila had to stay and Tingana mated with her yes it's not ideal and yes it's probably not something that we really want and it's not really how nature works but it would take a number of mating periods and a number of offspring to keep in breeding for there to be an actual problem genetically it's normally three to four generations of inbreeding that will then make something happen and, and genetic problems to to arise once in a while is not going to be an issue and and the fact of the matter is that our young boys Tamba Hosanna theoretically should in all likelihood push off and end up somewhere else I don't think that they're gonna have a situation where they're going to be um, dominant that much around here and mate with their aunts or their uh, mothers or anything like that um, I think it's more likely that they're going to end up somewhere else so I think for now quite closely related should be still viable in terms of their genetic DNA and still be okay um, but we'll, only time will tell as to whether or not it's an issue I, and I know it has happened in many other reserves where males and females um, that are related have bred and it, it takes a number of breeding times for it to actually negatively influence those individuals. Right, so nothing that is at this pan, which is why I wanted to come here, is just to check in case something was lying here. We know Hassan has been really favoring this pan the last few days. He's been here quite often, but there seems to be a lack of anybody actually around here. No antelope species, no leopard. I'm just checking in all the shady spots because if there is a cat around, it's going to be in the shady, cool areas, not lying out in the sun. So, I was hoping though that there would be some indication, but there's not even any tracks coming this way. So we're going to go back towards Spaghetti Junction now and just check around the Mulawati area there. So David, I think I got that. Sorry, there was another person that spoke quite loudly on the radio at the same time. But I believe you're asking, what is my most memorable leopard sightings of this year? <sighs> That's tough. I've been really spoiled to be honest. I've had such a wonderful year at Juma with leopards. I've been so fortunate to have seen some of the most crazy sightings. I've really had a lot of luck in. So, 
been my best. I, I would have to say that the top three for me have been those three leopards that we saw just now, the males all together. The fact that there was also a male lion and two hyenas also didn't detract from that sighting whatsoever. So VM has spotted something. Oh, there we go. A little Steenbok. So while we gaze upon the beauty of the Steenbok, I'll carry on with the other sightings that I have really enjoyed. That one, there has been the Tandi Shongile Hosana altercation that we had as well which was a sad one in some ways but also an incredible one and, and it's I suppose a bit bittersweet now because we haven't seen Shongile since that day so it's in a way it was just such an amazing thing to witness but since we haven't seen her it's kind of become a little bit more of a sore point than it has been an amazing one but it was still incredible behavior um, and then the other one was I would say the Tamba Hosana sort of in not, it's not really a fight but a meeting up and interaction at Twin Lambs that was just also absolutely phenomenal and the last one which has also been a multiple leopard sighting was the Tandi Shongile Mvula sighting where Mvula stole Shongile's kill and was feeding up on a tree and we had Shongile down below and then that other leopard came in and, and we we think it was Tandi we didn't get a proper view of her to make 100% sure but that was just such an amazing sighting as well because it was just things were just coming left right and center and so it's all been interaction amongst them more than anything else I actually haven't had too many leopard sightings where there's been other animals that have caused any problems but the interaction between the different leopards that we've had here on Juman because of Kruler's disappearance these newer members coming in and interacting with some of our sort of more well-known members have been really fascinating to watch and to see how they've kind of been sorting themselves out and also just to watch the young boys how they've kind of latched on to so many different leopards over the last few months has been absolutely wonderful but our Steenbok has moved away so I'm going to carry on as well Now I was talking about the Tamba Hosana Twin Dams incident and I believe Megan so like so nice of, of her has prepared a clip of them and is going to be able to show us. So while I kind of meander my way towards Spaghetti Crossing, let's have a little look at the two boys and their little interaction. Now, unfortunately, our clip didn't play properly, so you're back with us, but we have got a whole host of Steenbok together here. There looks as though there's at least three that I can see. So as I was driving off, we spotted another two of them. There's a young, young male. You can see small horns, and there's almost looks like another male that's almost chasing him and now lying down and that lying down behavior is very submissive there's also another steenbok that i can see so there's actually four here in total so i wonder if it's not two pairs a younger pair and an older pair coming together but look that steenbok lay down in almost a submissive behavior it lay down pushed its heads down and basically to say i'm not challenging you don't fight with me because the other one dropped its head and there we go now it's running off amazing there goes the other two after it so I don't quite know what's going on. I'm going to try and go back a little bit and just see. The behavior of these smaller antelope is so misunderstood because we just don't get to spend enough time with them and they generally are so flighty and so skittish that we very seldom actually see interactions between other individuals. But how cool is this? I can honestly say it's the first time that I've seen a Steenbok display almost leopard-like behavior and that it was just going down and kind of being submissive to the others and they still trotting off after one another and going deeper into the bush so I think there comes the third one now out of there or fourth one that's the fourth individual that's now crossing you can see that's got small little horns and still quite fluffy so that's a fairly young one I wonder if maybe they aren't pushing this young one away maybe it's more a situation of that where they've decided hang on a second you are reaching the age and the size where you need to go we've also bred because it's now summer months and Steenbok will be giving birth shortly and so maybe they've decided listen your time is up you need to now go and find somewhere else to go and settle interesting nonetheless and and certainly very cool to see glad that we got that on camera actually well done Vildi it's all thanks to Vildi he spotted all of those Steenbok as we were driving along now, in terms of the radio though if anybody wanted to know about updates and things like that no updates yet of anything really and so I think that we'll check, like I say, Spaghetti Junction. If there's nothing there, I'm not quite sure where I'm gonna go. I'll maybe start heading up Vulture's Nest, just in case, or Nyala Road South, just in case Hosanna's somewhere there, but 
was playing a dangerous game because like I said the signal is not so good up that way and so I don't want to lose signal and we go to tech loop I'd rather be kind of out and about and we'll try our very best to see if we can push it as much as we can before we head into an area where there is a little signal Ah, enchanted music, you want to know how we can tell which leopard is which. Well, I'm going to show you now how we do it. I just want to get into a shady spot so I don't cook VM's brain and my brain and don't dehydrate from being in the sun too much. So we're just going to quickly get around to a shadier section and then I'll show you exactly how we basically tell them apart. There's a number of different ways and everybody seems to have their own kind of exact take on it. The most common way though is to basically use spot patterns and now spot patterns generally refer to the whisker patterns that we get. So I'll show you right now what I'm talking about. So if I get my phone I'll try and get the spot patterns that I can show you what exactly I mean. But effectively we have spot patterns around the whisker area and the whisker area gives us a good idea of exactly what we're talking about. So if you have a look here, there those whisker patterns that we can see on Kuchava. So these are her whiskers and then just above you see one, two, three dots and then one, two, three. So you'll often hear people say that a leopard is a three, three individual or a two, three or a four, three and that's referring to those spots and those are unique on every single leopard. No two leopards will have the exact same spot pattern over the whisker. It's almost like a fingerprint. Then the other place that we use for basically doing IDs is these bars and spots above the eyes, around the edges of the eyes and also across the forehead. You know with Karula we used to use wow across the forehead but there will be these markings also very unique and then certain leopards will have random little markings on them that will be able to tell them apart. So Tingana's got a smiley face on his shoulder, um, hosana has got a little marking on his tail region and all of those things will help with being able to ID them. So that's how we do it. Also then after after you see them a number of times you start to recognize them as individuals and certain little features like for me Tumba has got those light eyes, dark markings, I just know him straight away with a little pink nose whereas Hassan has got the nick out of his left ear and he's got that sort of darker orange eyes and, and a little bit more of a dark sort of barring across his nose so to speak. Now there's our red billed hornbill that's just joining in in the conversation has decided that since we're talking about spots it would show its spots of its own. Hornbills have quite nice spotty little wing patterns with a big red beak and they are a quite beautiful birds aren't they? Not the cleverest, uh, do entertain me though. I watch the hornbills at camp very, very much and then, well very much is not very good English actually, I'm speaking too much, that's why. Um, I watch them a lot and, and they do entertain me thoroughly. They'll sit and they'll pick at the windows and they go after themselves and each other and it's just all a big game to them. And the reason why I say they're not very bright is because they will, I watched a red-billed hornbill like this one the other day and it was about 20 minutes that it sat pecking at a window at its own reflection. It literally was just pecking the reflection over and over again to the point where I'm sure that bird must have had a mild concussion and was probably not able to fly too much. Maybe that's why it sat there for as long as it did afterwards because then it sat there for a while without pecking before it eventually flew away but they seem to really be a sucker for punishment so to speak of themselves. Right, come on Mulawati show us what you've got. There must be a leopard somewhere here. It's the right conditions for a Mulawati leopard. It's hot, it's bright and sunny which means that hopefully there should be an individual in the shade somewhere around here. Let's just check if there's any tracks. So no tracks that I can see. I always scan this area very carefully because since that time when Tumba spent so much time here it was a place where it was really good just to look around. There's lots of little shady sort of areas and places where a leopard could sit and Tumba spent so much time here that and we drove past him so many different times that it's worth going a little slower through this section and looking very carefully and just watching and making 100% sure before you move on. So that's why I'm just checking and looking for tracks as well. What we'll do is probably do Nyala Road South now, check the mud wallows off Nyala Road South, see if there isn't some sign there. Still no tracks for elephants though, I'm surprised. With this hot weather, it's normally elephant weather, you normally find lots of ellies out in this weather. 
but I don't know. It seems as though our elephant friends have found themselves somewhere else to spend the summer so far. And they haven't really come into our area much at all. Still no tracks that I can see of anything. I wonder, I, I wonder if this female track that we saw earlier is not somewhere back in the Mulawati and that we've just kind of driven past her by not going into the Mulawati itself. I'll have to, maybe maybe we'll try go back around there. It might take Central, go Mamba and then go Batalia, I mean Batalia and then Mamba and just double check those areas and just see if maybe she's not walked on one of those roads as well. I think Byron did tell me that he had tracks for a female this morning. Right, now I believe Megan has found a sighting that, well, she says is one of her favorites and it was of good old Hosanna having a little stalk at Twin Dams. Well, apparently not. Apparently it's still not downloading properly, so it seems as though the gremlins have interrupted those clips too, which means well, it's still me, and still me chatting away. Right. I thought I, there was a grey go-away bird that alarm called, and that's also why I was just quickly looking at that pan and just trying to check if there wasn't something lying there. But alas, nothing ob obvious that I could see. We'll check also there's another little pan just up ahead here on the left hand side that's also not a bad one to have a look for. If anything it's not a great place for during the day because not really much shade but it's a good track trap so to speak. So if any leopard did come here which it looks like little pug marks on the road somewhere here. Right now we're going to try that again with Hasana's little stalk at Twindams while I grab a little sip of water and so let's see if it'll actually play this time but look at him he's look at how low to the ground look at that isn't that incredible he's doing the leopard crawl it is my favorite thing to see from a leopard is when they crawl like that and he is in the best possible light that we could ask for how cool is this look he's just checking over the damn wall well done Hosanna you are slowly but surely working things out that's for sure but look at this, he's crawling straight towards us. That is beyond epic. <laughs> now the Impala is coming straight towards him, but it's going to see him. He's right out in the open. Is that not ridiculous, guys? How cool is that? That is as cool as it gets when it comes to seeing the two of them. Now I wonder if he's going to explode out from there. The Impalas haven't seen him yet. They, if they look to the left, they're going to spot him, surely. He's right out in the open. Nope. That Impala hasn't seen him. He's waiting for the smallest one, which is going to come over now. It's the youngest of the Impalas. is a much smaller individual that is right at the back, and that's going to be the one that I think he might have a go at. But look at that. Amazing. Look, look, the Impala's walking closer. He wants to investigate what's going on. Hosanna's lying flat. Look at that. Oh, there we go. You see, they've seen him now. They think it's a leopard. They're not 100% sure, but he's lost that advantage now. Isn't that also an incredible sighting? It was amazing that period that we went through with Hassan around all the dams stalking, and he was so close. If it wasn't for that last impala that spotted him, as well, I suppose it was actually the third last impala that spotted him and saw him, the little one right at the back, I think, would have been in trouble. And I think we would have seen Hassan grab that little one because there was a smaller one right at the tail end. And had the others gone over that damn wall, I don't think that little one would have had a chance. I think. And I was waiting for that small one, but it was an amazing thing to watch I just loved the fact that he leopard crawled and he was down on his tummy It was just the coolest thing to see I love when leopards do that and to see him out in the open doing it was just that much more special It also goes to show how difficult it is to see a leopard even with a male lying out in the open like that 
of a blade of grass covering him. Three impalas still walked past him before the one noticed him, which is, to me, just shows how well they camouflage and why they're successful as predators. When they get into thickets, you can imagine how difficult it must be to be able to actually see that animal and to pick him up and to actually then avoid him. So it's a testament to not only the, the amazing ability of a leopard to, to blend, but also the incredible eyesight and, and senses that the prey animals have to avoid leopards in these thickets and not just on the roads and open sections like they had to deal with there. It would have been cool to have seen him kill an impala though. I don't think we've had any sign of, well we haven't had an actual sort of sighting of Hosanna grabbing a big carcass yet. We've seen him feeding on big carcasses but we haven't actually seen him grabbing one for himself. So it would be nice to see and just see how he goes about it and whether or not he sort of struggles or if it comes quite naturally or how it actually all works. But maybe one day. Also it's a complete sort of what's the word now I suppose a bogey sighting for me it's a sighting that if you can believe on all the time that I've spent with a leopard and with leopards over the years that I'm still yet to see a leopard take a adult impala which sounds really odd and it's and it's a bane of my existence because I've spent probably more hours than a lot of people with leopards and I've yet to see them grab a fully grown impala. I've seen them grab all kinds of other things and chase after fully grown impalas but never a successful fully grown impala hunt. It's all been babies and that's it. So I'm really hoping at some stage to break the droughts. You'll probably find when I do, when it does happen, I'll end up seeing five or six of them in the space of a short period of time. It's normally like that when you struggle to find something and when eventually you do see it, it's, it's kind of commonplace. I'm just checking around this area. Also, I forgot to mention the other day that I know some of you are, have been asking about the migratory birds and which ones have been arriving and carrying and, and, and sort of wondering which ones are next. I actually saw a violet backed starling the other day. So it's the first one that I've seen of the summer. I don't know if Byron's maybe seen one on his drives, but there was one male violet backed starling that was on one of the trees and I was hoping to get it on camera. And as we swung the camera, it ended up flying away. So it's a really special one to see as well. And they bring a lot of color to this area. And for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm going to try and find you a picture now. I just didn't want to stop down below and while I actually try and find the picture there's some little dwarf mongoose that are running around on my left hand side here on the mound itself they close to where they would probably spend their time trying to um, hide out from predators and so they are feeding in, in the afternoon sun and kind of going around and as soon as there's a some sort of a disturbance they run up onto that termite mound like what you just saw now and then they go into those holes in order to get away from predators but I really like dwarf mongoose they're funny little creatures they're all over the place never sitting still always bouncing around all over the show so they are a real enjoyment and entertaining animal to watch going around now I'm just trying to find the violet backed starling so here it is here it is got to be one of the most incredible colorations that I've seen on a bird look at the color of that that is iridescent violet that comes off the back of this bird with bright white plum plumage on the chest. It is absolutely phenomenally beautiful. Right, so there we go. That female leopard has just been found now, right where we had the tracks and in the Mulawati. If we had just driven there, we would have found her. So I'm going to try and get there and so we can hopefully get reception. It's quite frustrating because we would have found that leopard had we just driven in the Mulawati. I told Rex, Rex, I've got those tracks. They're very fresh. Please check the Mulawati. I can't go in there yet. And he said he drove in there and not even 20 meters he found the leopard. So he's very happy and he's telling me that I must come as quickly as I can. But how amazing is that? So there we go. Tundi, I'm sure it's Tundi that is there. Super exciting and super glad that we managed to get somebody onto those tracks to help us out because now I can go there and, and hopefully we'll get some sort of reception. At least we can at least try get a little bit of a reception in that area. But I just want to get hold of him on the radio, so I do apologize. Rex, Rex. Rex, you copy. Let's confirm you found that uh, leopard there by the big jackal bay. Copy 
thanks Rex. So apparently what's happened is she's gone where we checked at that little water hole and crossed the Mulawati. Her tracks were on top of our tracks there when Rexon went down and he just found her lying right there. So we were 10 minutes too early or if we had just driven the Mulawati we would have found her. But exciting news nonetheless. It also sounds like she's in a place where we might have reception because she's on the bank of the Mulawati, not right down in the riverbed now. She's moved up and onto the bank itself where our vehicle was where we had reception just now. So that's really good news and it means that hopefully we will be able to see her which is really exciting and well I'll be super happy to spend the afternoon with one of our females I don't know who it is just yet I, I presume it's Tundi because like I say the track size and where she is but who knows maybe because we we're talking about Shungile we can throw that into the breeze and maybe just maybe you never know I don't know And I believe a lot of you are excited about the prospects of Leopard. I would imagine that some of you are, and whether it's Shongile or Tandi, many of you are fans of either one. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of happy campers, including these two gentlemen in this vehicle that are going to be very happy to spend the afternoon with the Leopard. I know VM loves our spotted friends, and well, so do I, as we all know. And so I'm certainly going to be smiling and grinning like a Cheshire cat if we get to spend the afternoon with Tandi. She's one of my favorite females. In fact, she is the favorite female that I've seen in the Sabi Sands over the years. I know she can be a bit grumpy and she can be aggressive and I know she fought the Shongile but it's all instinct and natural and I find her incredibly interesting and, and uh, to watch and to see how she's moved around and how her fluid, her territory has been over the years has been fascinating to watch. So she really is an interesting cat and she is, she is beautiful as well. So hopefully it will be either her or Shongile. I would love, love, love to catch up with Shongile again. Just to put to bed a lot of rumors, I saw a funny rumor the other day. Oh, VM, look, there's a kudu. I don't, VM, have you seen a kudu in two weeks? So VM says it's his first kudu since he's been back and it's my first kudu since I've been back from leave as well. Now I know we are going to a leopard but we'll stop and just admire our kudu because it's been so long since we've seen them, either of us. I wonder where they've been. They have seemed to have been absolutely vacant the last few weeks and maybe they've been a bit further south where there was a bit more rains and now they're going to start coming back into this area but definitely a sight for sore eyes. They're an animal that while they are common and we see them a lot, it's still great to see kudu and still great to see them roaming around their beautiful animals, their big ears and it would be really nice you know to have them around and to see them particularly the big males I love the males with their big curly horns and Megan was saying I think Byron was mentioning it or Megan was mentioning it to Byron this morning that we haven't seen them in quite some time so nice to see they also the reason why I like having kudu is that they generally in areas on crests like where we are now and this is areas that a lot of the time we don't drive and these guys often spot predators for us and they, their alarm call is so loud and so deep that you hear it from far away and they often give away the presence of a lot of our predators in places that typically we wouldn't actually be driving. So good to see them again. They're a vital component of our system and like I say they are just absolutely beautiful animals. And there we go, crossing the road. I think there's one more that's going to come over and head and then once that one crosses we're going to continue on our journey towards the leopard but worth taking a moment just to enjoy the beauty of the kudu. Deadhead <laughs> Tom, you say you love saying the word kudu. I know it is quite fun, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a weird word and not something you would ever think of saying, but I suppose if you in a situation where you uh, kind of think of the word and the sound that they make, it's very inappropriate name to have given them. There's interestingly a track for another leopard over there. Not very fresh, but there is a track. Now I was saying just now that there are rumors about Shongile being sold to a zoo and it's the normal kind of story when we have a leopard that's not seen for a while where they hunted and they sold and all the other nonsense that comes out of this stuff that is just complete drivel and completely baseless information. There is no such thing as leopards from the Sabi Sands being sold to zoos in any shape or form. It doesn't happen. It's illegal. 
until it's not possible, we will not see it happening in the Sabi Sands. It is controlled. They do not allow our leopards to be sold, hunted, whatever the case may be that people say. So it might be a situation that she's unfortunately been killed by a natural animal, yes, and we might never know that she's been killed by them, much like Karula. It could very well be possible, but she could also have distributed to an area where we're just not seeing her. You never know. So hopefully she will be around at some point to put a lot of these rumors to bed because it gets pretty tiring every time we see a leopard going missing that all of these conspiracy theories of zoos and hunting and us selling them and us killing them and not telling people comes up again and again and again so you know it's hopefully that she will come out and, and just so that those people can realize that you know what they're saying and what they're spreading is just absolute nonsense and that we can actually get past these kind of things and rather base our opinions on facts and sort of evidence rather than just trying to cause some sort of a drama about what goes on out here because I can tell you right now if any of our leopards were sold to a zoo I would be the first one that would be up in arms and I'd be the first one to complain if any of our leopards were hunted for any reason whatsoever and so I can guarantee you that those things are not happening and most certainly if they were there would be a massive outcry from a number of lodges these animals at the end of the day while they are wild animals they have also here where anim where people are seeing them and they they are providing a lot of people the chance to see them which means that there's a lot of companies that are based around this which make a lot of money out of it and that basically means that they are going to do everything they can to protect this area and to make sure that there is these animals to last for many years they're not going to do things to basically detriment that factor and, and to cause an issue for themselves so it's a, it's complete nonsense to think that we would do those kind of things Right, but on to happier thoughts and on to better things now that I've finished my, I suppose, rant if you want to call it that. But it's just like I say, it uh, touches on a nerve string every now and then when I read some of the stuff that comes up. And it, it hopefully we'll get to a point in some stage in life where we don't have to worry about those kind of things and that people will actually kind of come up with their own opinions based on facts and things that they've seen. Regardless though, any leopard that we do find now is going to be a pretty one and hopefully it will be a good sighting and we'll spend quite some time with her it sounds like it's fairly quiet out here so I would imagine a number of vehicles are going to head in this direction but I'm hoping that we'll be able to spend most of our afternoon with these particular well this particular individual there's also a nice thing is that there is um, lions in Torchwood so hopefully that will also mean a lot of the guys go and track those lions and we are free to carry on with our leopard. Now I'm going to throw into the Mulawati. I do apologize if there is a breakup in the reception and signal and so while I say that it sounds like the bar is up and running and my Leo Smith is out and ready to cast off in the Mara so let's go across to him and see what his plans are for the afternoon. Well, there you can see that little green circle is where we are now on the edge of this large low pressure system that just literally nearly blew our tents down. It was an absolutely massive storm and uh, it also unfortunately blew our internet antenna off the top of the mast, but fortunately we have Alexander Voz who managed to fix it as quickly as possible. Good afternoon and welcome to the studio. My name is Brent Leo Smith and I'm in James Henry's chair, but I've made it better. I've put a shuka in it. I know, and a kikoi. James is not partial to shukas. And I have Craig the Batman on camera with me today. So we had probably about 50 or 60 mils of rain, but that wasn't the scary part. It was the incredible winds that were rolling through our camp. And afterwards, we actually went and had a walk, and you can't really see it from here. But there's this little river system that flows down in front of camp and actually supplies us with water. And there's another river system on the other side of camp. And when we came out after the wind had rocked through the camp, there was just this low roar of two waterfalls on either side of camp um, making incredible noise. Actually, I went and had a walk and had a look at them, and it was, it was really impressive. So Jamie and Taylor are on their way down. They've decided to brave the wet, and unfortunately, I'm going to warn you now, they're going to have to stay on the main roads. 
uh, due to the fact uh, that if they went off those roads, they would definitely be the queens of the Marshmallow Club. Now, apparently there's been some lovely comments about my sugar. This is my oldest and uh, most favorite of all my sugars. I have had this one for nearly eight or nine years, and it was given to me um, by my anti-poaching staff that I used to work with in Tanzania, so it's quite a special one. Um, this is my... Wait, let me just change this again. No, well, this is my black tie kikoi um, for when I feel like I'm feeling fancy. And since I'm in James's studio, I thought I'd better dress up and put my black tie kikoi on. Now, last time I was in the studio, I managed to put my boots on everything. Fortunately for James, who is long gone back in South Africa now, I'm actually going to be barefoot this afternoon. I prefer being barefoot. I don't really like shoes too much. But as I was saying, we've got lots of fun stuff in the studio, and um, probably the most fun thing for me is, is the stepladder. Now, one will wonder, why is there a stepladder inside? See, well, the stepladder is for this particular shelf right here. So when James is here, he has to use the stepladder to get to the shelf. That's the only way he can get to the books. Of course, I'm joking. He uses the stepladder for this shelf. Now, of course, I don't have that problem. Uh, I can just reach up and take a book from the, st uh, from, from the shelf without the stepladder, but the stepladder is there for, for James. And we do miss him. Uh, he is enjoying a good holiday, and uh, he will be hopefully invigorated when he gets back. Now, let's quickly go across to the map, which is behind us. Now, as you can see, we've cleaned off all the pictures that James has, had put on the map, and we're going to start again. And you can see James's great artwork, where he's painted the Mara River blue. He forgot a spot there, um, down there. No, I'm only kidding. There's a purpose. I'm not sure why. But, so, I'm just going to let you know what's happening in the Mara at the moment with the different, specifically the migration and the cheetah movements at the moment. Now, Musiara's two twin girls are still together, and they are staying in this area, which is not no man's land. It's actually the Paradise Plain um, around here. So from Governor's Camp um, right down to the main crossings, uh, that is where those two female cheetah are. Now, I've just heard from Scott um, yesterday, I was having a chat with him, let's find uh, the Talek River, there we go, um, that he found Musiara, um, which is quite interesting, and she was just over here in between the Talek and the Rongkai. Now, Musiara was last seen mating with the two border boys right here on the Tanzanian border. So very, very interesting that she is now already back that side, and there's a very strong chance she's going to encounter those five boys, so there could be very interesting behavior there. Now, Amani, who's the mother of the two that are hanging around there, is still staying around Sala's camp, and uh, oh, I can't remember her name now, but we saw a very old female, I will find her name, probably one of the oldest living females in the Mara at the moment that we saw on safari a while ago. She's over there. Now, of course, the five boys are all around the Rongkai. So this area here, balloon crossing area. The border boys um, back on the triangle side, they should be coming back from their visit to Tanzania. Now, um, Kakenya, I haven't seen yet, but Kakenya's two daughters, I have seen a bit of. We found the one female with four cubs quite close to camp. We haven't seen her. I think she's moved into this area here where we do struggle for signal. Her other daughter had four cubs, is now down to two. I actually saw her the other morning, but unfortunately, again, in a bad signal area around here. And uh, apparently there's another female that was seen called Mlima in this area here somewhere, but I cannot verify that. The wildebeest, however, are literally littered, 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 littered. I went across yesterday and I was sitting on the northern side of the Talek River and from the northern side of the Talek all the way down to Salas. I'm not sure what's happening further to the east, but this area is still full of migration. Now, the big question that comes, is it the main migration or is it the loiter herd? For those who don't know what the loiter herd is, the loiter herd, let's go back to the computer there, Batman, I've got a map out. Um, the, the loiter herd is the resident. Um, oh, I was looking at something else. I was looking at Lake Tanganyika. Apologies, apologies. Let us go back up here. So the loiter herd of wildebeest is a herd of wildebeest that stays in Kenya. So as we know, the mi main migration actually 
better than the map. Let's go to th that other map. I forgot we had two maps. Craig, you're going to fall on your bottom if you trip over your cable there. So what we're, we're sitting at here is this is the main migration. Now, I've heard lots of different things about how big the Loiter heard. I heard it was 50,000. I've heard it's 100,000. I've heard it's 200,000. Now, after sp speaking to someone who was actually with them last year, they are between 200 and possibly up to 500,000 wildebeest. So that is the Loiter herd. The Loiter herd does not do this massive move all the way down and around and back into Kenya. The loiter herd stays in Kenya. It leaves the Maasai Mara, however, and it heads out of the park through that mountain range along the Tanzanian border to an area just around here called the loiter plains. And that is where they traditionally birth. However, last year, for the first time in history, they birthed on the Paradise Plain. So. This area right here had 100,000 wildebeest in January and February, all birthing. Now, that could happen again this year. There's very lots of different reasons for it happening. Uh, most possibly, the, the main reason for it happening is actually one of the main reasons that most great migrations in the world have collapsed, and that is the advent of farming and fences. So it's going to be interesting to see whether the loiter herd is going to stay in the Mara and they're going to give us a, a, our very own massive wildebeest birthing right here in Kenya, or are they going to try and move out of the Maasai Mara onto the loiter plains. Now, as I was saying, we've got lots of planned, but I think this was a good just intro. Um, we can all sort of see out of the window. It's a bit, bit, bit shiny, but I'm trying to see if we can spot um, Taylor or Jamie making their way down the hill. We can't, and I can't even use the mountain cam because the rain got so, so, so much, it has misted up the mountain cam. I think we're going to have to send Martin, our latest technician, on James's stepladder to go clean the camera. What do you guys think? And I forgot, if you have any questions for us about what's going on, um, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. But without further ado, let's go to my very good friend who's very good at finding leopards, Tristan. Thank you, Brent Leo Smith. You're not too shabby yourself. It was always nice working with Brent. We always used to have fun trying to find leopards before each other. But this afternoon I seem to be struggling. Tundi has just vanished under everybody's noses in this horrible thick stuff that we're in at the moment. Now we're right on that little two-track road that we took earlier to go check that pan. So I don't know where she's gone. She needs to somehow slip in between everybody and move out and we've lost her completely so I don't know quite where she is now between Rex myself and Tax we can't find any sign of Tundi at the moment so I'm sure she's here it's just a matter of just driving around and, and we'll eventually get her again it's just Rex said he got up the bank and he lost visual of her as he got up the bank and now he can't find where she's gone but she was heading slowly in an easterly direction So Taylor in the Mara says that I must try harder for her. Well, Taylor, I'm, I'm trying and so far no luck just yet. I, I don't know where this cat could have gone to. I don't see any tracks of any kind. I'm sure she's still somewhere in one of these thickets, but it is dense and it's difficult to see anything inside here. So I'm hoping that she's just going to pop out somewhere where I can see her. There was some Nyala and a Stienbok on the northern side of where we are, which means that I'm thinking she either is stalking that and is very low and that's why we can't see her, or she's come southwards and that's why we've missed her. She's moved along the southern bank area, but I don't know. I can't see any sign of her, that's for sure. Now the reason why I've come up this way is because I wanted to check along the bank a little bit but now i'm just getting myself into a big mess here and getting ourselves into a massive thicket so i don't know tandy why are you giving us a hard time come back so apparently rexon says it was tandy that he saw so hopefully she's here somewhere where are you girl Right, there's another Nyala there that's quiet, so she must still be somewhere on this side in one of these thickets. So now it's just a matter, like I say, of just doing some zigzags until we find her and 
while we do that I believe Jamie is also now reached the bottom of the hill and is ready and rearing to go so let's jump across to her and see where she's heading this afternoon Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're so late. The weather had other plans that did not involve being able to even escape from the kitchen. A very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon, Jahawi is on a camera with me, and we're very excited. This is the first time he's been out with me, so hopefully we have a fantastic, well, muddy, let's, let's be honest, muddy drive this afternoon. Let's stop quickly and look for the pregnant zebra. Let's have a look and see if we can get the one-eared pregnant zebra. Oh, I can hear somebody coming up behind me. That's Taylor also on her way out. Hello. We're just doing our... Uh, oh, no. Our antenna is falling down. That is really unfortunate. We really need to fix that. Okay. All right. Your, your, yours is up, right? Yours is... Mine's gone through. That is highly unfortunate. Okay. Well, I, d I don't want that. I really don't want that. So, um, apparently we have a minor problem, relatively major problem with our antenna that will require a certain degree of fixing immediately before we, we damage something which is going to happen relatively soon. Oh, I keep forgetting about the delay. We've got, a, we've got about 10 second delay between us and Juma. So what we're going to do is send you across to the lovely Taylor, who's the one who pointed out our problem, and we will catch up with you soon. Well, not too far away. I actually rolled the car forward slightly because I thought I don't want to boom over poor Jamie. It is very loud. I'm louder than the wind, louder than the zebras munching. But my name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Sebastian. And hopefully we're going to do lots of slipping and sliding. Yes, I said hopefully because it's one of my favorite things to do. But we're st restricted to the main roads today because everything has pretty much just turned into a wetland. Let's drive. Let's drive on. So we have a choice of two roads and Jamie and I played rock, paper, scissors to decide on uh, which roads we will be taking. So I... We didn't play rock, paper, scissors. That was a bit of a story. It just sounded a lot better. <laughs> but anyways, uh, ba basically Jamie has given me the privilege of driving the river road and she's going to take the opposite road. So hopefully she gets the sausage tree pride or some lions on the way and we'll see what else we can find. But for now, she needs to make sure that she gets that antenna up and working again. So we'll keep driving. Uh, I can't believe how much water is around. It looks like, it honestly looks like the Mara River. Maybe we'll go to the Mara River. Let's do that. Uh, so we'll go towards cul-de-sac in those areas because it looks like it's overflowing at the moment. Could the Mara River be overflowing? Could it be spilling out from its edges? Maybe. But if you have perhaps just stumbled across this and you're wondering what on earth Safari Live is about, it's a live and interactive show. So you can actually ask me questions or you can ask Brain questions or Tristan or Jamie when she's all uh, back and ready uh, for the show. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or talk to us via the YouTube chat. And now, look at the stream. We're gonna do some amphibians today, I think. I think we're gonna look for all the frogs. So I think River Road will probably be a good road. It's just a pity that I don't have a frog book of East Africa. That would have been, um, well, that would have gone down very well this, uh, this afternoon. And Irma, it seems as though that's exactly what you were wanting to see with some frogs. So Irma, uh, just for you, I will try and find you some amphibians to have a look at and hopefully we get lucky. It'll be nice. I can hear them. Oh, I saw one. Let's just hope Jamie's not driving behind me. In this mud well over here, I thought I saw a head poking out. Yes, what's, it was the stick. You see what I'm talking about? In that second mud well, there's a brown thing. Yes, you're right on it. What are you, are you a frog? I have spotted a piece of grass and a stick and one that's so wonderful so Irma here we go it's a great start off to the frogging afternoon 
I'm sorry. I'm such a failure at finding frogs. <laughs> we'll find some more though. So I think, you know what, the best time to actually see them is at dusk when they start becoming a bit more active. Obviously they're chirping now. They're being sneaky though. They're singing in the corners uh, where we can't see them. But at night you can put the spotlight up on them and illuminate them quite nicely. We'll have infrared on too. And I think... Uh, that we'll get some nice ones. Would you might have to help me, so be pre be prepared. Maybe if you can, now start prepping. Let's get a list of the most common frogs that we can find. I do have one on my phone, which we'll go through at some point. I just need to find it. And um, maybe we can get images, because it's one thing knowing all the names of the frogs, but some of the different species look so similar to one another, like the ridge frogs and the grass frogs. To me, they look almost identical with the same sort of features. So... Uh, it'll be nice to sort of have some uh, sort of visual references and like I said I don't have a book unfortunately on East African frogs but we can work together this afternoon it'll be lots of fun I think um, but you know what it seems as though Tristan's gone and done it again he's stolen the show he's found a spot of cats of sorts we have indeed you can see why we drove round her a few times before we actually found her. There she is tucked away in the thickets and so it's definitely Tundi from what I can see. I mean at the moment I can't see anything but a spot of a back I mean just from the camera itself and that's what we were looking for. So you can see why a leopard is a tough animal to find. It blends in incredibly well. Now I don't think she's going to be there all afternoon. I'm pretty sure she's going to get up and move around and she's not going to be stationary the whole afternoon but at least we've got her now and, and, and that means that we should be able to follow her wherever she does head for the remainder of the afternoon. So I'm super excited that we managed to find her again and it was thanks to Vildi's great eyes because we drove past and we heard the birds alarming and we stopped here and Vildi said just reverse a little bit for me and he reversed back and then he spotted her in this thicket and like I say it's not easy to see her at all. You can see how much vegetation there is between us and her and, and to spot her is not easiest thing. The good thing is though and the good news is that there is a number of prey animals all around us. There's Nyala, there's Steenbok, there's a Diker so I would imagine that she is actually going to start hunting at some point. We must have missed her by I'd say minutes as she crossed over Twin Dams Road and down into the Mulawati and I'm glad that we managed to get some reception. At least we're up on the bank on the eastern side now which means that there is a little bit more height and so we should have reception for the remainder of the afternoon which is really really good news. Deadhead Tom you're saying she's looking oh so regal she is isn't she I mean besides the fact that there's about 40 bushes in between us and her she is looking as regal as she can be and she's probably wondering what all the fuss is and vehicles driving all over the place far away from her when she's right here but she's definitely making this area her own that's for sure this is I think about the sixth or seventh sighting I've had of Tundi in this particular section of the Twin Dam sort of area and so she seems as though she's really settling and it's great news for us. The more she, time she spends here and the more she tries to get herself um, established in this area the more likely it is for us to see her denning around this section. So I'm convinced that she's going to den in the Mulawati this year. I'm convinced that it's going to be somewhere on our side. I'm just hoping that it will be somewhere right in the center and we'll get to see little cubs at some point. Now, whether it's going to be this year or next year is debatable. The last time I saw her, she looked as though she had a small little tummy that could potentially indicate that she might be on the pregnant side. But we're going to have a look today for sure. We'll stay with her as much as we can and hopefully she is going to move and come out of that thicket and we'll be able to tell whether or not she's actually pregnant for sure, which is going to be good. Um, from where I am now, just trying to see if there isn't another sort of place that we can potentially see her to give VM sort of more of help than what we've got right now, it really is very difficult for him to kind of focus on what's going on. So what I think I might do is go in and just reverse in here, VM. Is that going to be better, do you think? Or not? Well, we can try and go forward, VM. Let's try and see. I'm going to try and just find a different gap for VM because, like I say, there's about 40 million trees in the way between where we are and where she is. And so I don't really want to try and kind of get into a situation where uh, I don't think this is going to get any better, VM. There we go. Now I just want to see what it looks like from this side. She really has put herself in the worst possible place for us, for a lip.
But of course, this is the best possible place that she could be in. She really has gotten herself into a great spot where she can kind of rest. It's shady, it's perfect camouflage inside there. It's just for us as people, it's not quite ideal. But I think I've got a little gap here. I just want to try and see. I also don't want to drive too close to where she is. I can see where Rex is. Sorry, Vildi. I can see where she is now as well, which means hopefully if I can get in here, we're going to get a perfect view of her. There we go. How's that, Vim? That's much better. How's that? There we go. Now we're winning. So that's a much, 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 much better place for us to be. We can at least now see her really nicely and she is looking ever so pretty. She has got to be one of the prettier leopards that we've got out here. Well, in my opinion, anyway, I like her face and you can see she's wearing a sporting hat. Is that a little scar on her nose at the moment? It looks like a little kind of scrape on there. It's a funny kind of shape that she's got. It almost <laughs> looks very similar to a burn of some sort. But maybe it's just a little bit of fur that's looking a bit funny. Maybe there's some water on there or something like that. Mrs. Zero, a pregnant leopard, as soon as she realizes pregnant, as soon as her, she'll be able to out that there's that happens, she's going to start marking territory. And I'm 900% convinced, Vildi and I were talking about this, that it was not a male calling. And if that is the case, it means that Tandi is calling and that's probably to set up a territory to make sure that she's now starts prepping for her denning when she is going to den. When they have are pregnant, we'll start to see them scent marking a lot more than normal, vocalizing a lot, doing a lot of walking and a lot of traveling. And then she'll start to in the den last sort of pregnancy, which is the last sort of 30 days, 20 to 30 days. That's when she's going to be going to these drainage sections. And for that. It's just one of those things sometimes to bring you those incredible leopard sightings. We have to go beyond the boundaries of signal. And Tristan, of course, is, well, he's the leopard man of Juba. He's had so many absolutely fantastic leopard sightings that I'm really feeling quite jealous because I've seen about three. Exaggeration. I've seen at least five, maybe, no, about ten leopards in the last five months. And it's one thing I really, really miss about being in the Sabi sand. The leopards are still here, it's just finding them is that much trickier. And often when we do find them, they're in places that are not fantastic for signal. But you never know, we might get lucky this afternoon, who knows? It's poured with rain, which means all of the territorial animals are going to be out and marking territories and all sorts of other things. I'm very impressed at Taylor's, well, first of all, speed, but also bravery. Let's go and find out how full the river is. Well, <laughs> Jamie, don't worry, we're not at the Mara River. <laughs> no wonder you're wondering how on earth did I get there so quickly. We're just in this little um, sort of bridge that we go over where the hippo skull is and the water is raging through here at the moment. This doesn't quite make it all the way to the Mara River, but it runs down from the escarpment and, and it is pushing through underneath this bridge at a rapid rate. It almost looks like there's a riptide of sorts form. Can you see how the river is heading off in the in a southerly direction? And then there's a little spot that turns back and comes around to the left. So it's basically just like a jacuzzi swirling around, a big brown, jacuzzi maybe a chocolate milk jacuzzi but very cool i just wanted to quickly show you we're still going to head towards the mara river but we have, have fading light at the moment so i reckon that we should race on over look at me rolling my eyes like brent we all rub on off on each other now i must tell you something very funny and hopefully brent is sitting in final control right now and he's got the volume turned up the other day and jamie will back me brent and i played a game of darts now, Brent is close to one of the most competitive people I've ever met, but it, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's pretty cool. I'm pretty competitive as well. 
And that's why I enjoyed our bird challenges so much and the Sabi's had. It was always fun. And our frog challenges. And I managed to beat Brent at darts by some miracle. I don't know how, but I'll take it. It was so great. And I, I, I understand why he has kept it quiet. But uh, I suspect that a rematch is on the way, though. A rematch we shall have at some point. Um, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun, too. And just encouraging me to keep getting better and better at darts. So that's a game that we play around camp. It's a new game. So everybody wants to play it. Sometimes it's so difficult to get a chance at the dart board. You've got to play before you go on safari and you've got to light the board up using your headlights of a car. Well, that's what I do, you know, to get a bit of practice in. Um, but we're on the river road now and we're going to keep heading down along it. And we'll, hopefully we'll stop and see all sorts of wonderful things. We'll see what... Um, Hummercorp, what are we going to call that area, that lugger that's filled with water where we saw the Hummercorps this morning? Hummercorp pan, but nah, because there was a area where I used to work. I don't know. We'll find out something hilarious to call it. And, uh, and uh, maybe we'll see some more of those crown bullfrogs or something else. But we'll keep on heading that way. We've got a bit of a way to go. Brent has managed to locate all sorts of wonderful creatures on the river cams. And this time it seems to be a crocodile. I'm the crocodile. Oopsie. Let me put myself on mute. I was listening to what McCurdy was saying. Of course, I let her win at darts um, just so I could beat her heavily the next time we played. So actually, you know what? We wanted to talk a bit about crocodiles, of course, with the river cams, crocodiles have been a really big focus. And this is a beautiful specimen of a crocodile. Now, quite often you can, not exactly, but sometimes you can figure out how big a crocodile is by looking at its head. Now, I have noticed in the morrow we've got some really big fat crocodiles that this, this doesn't apply to you because you normally work in the length. And I actually worked um, with crocodiles quite a lot when I was quite young. And uh, if we have a look here, so if we had to add all the, the meat and whatnot, you'd probably be, be sitting at about this, oh, probably about 15 centimeters sticking out of the water. Now, this is a, by no means a scientific exact science. It is, it is sort of a form of guessing. And uh, that can generally, so 15 centimeters, you could probably say this guy was probably four to five meters long, uh, probably closer to four and a half meters, not as big as five, but a really big specimen, probably weighing about eight or 900 kilograms. Now, what I thought about is um, because we see such massive, big, fat crocodiles in the morrow, we do a little bit of chat about big crocodiles in Africa in general. Now, as far as my understanding, the largest Nile crocodile ever to exist, and it cannot be confirmed because he is still alive and still causing absolute havoc in Burundi. His name is Gustav, um, and he lives in Lake Tanganyika, and he's said to be about five and a half meters long. Now, the largest known for fact, dead Nile crocodile um, was from the Congo, and I went and found a picture of him a little bit earlier. Oh dear. Steph came in and did emails, and he's. I, I hope he. No, he has. He's got, um, all my, my, my tabs I had open. So I'll actually have to. I'll, I'll find it again shortly. Let me just do quickly. No, we'll do it just now. But uh, Gustav, a lot of you might have heard of National Geographic did a documentary on trying to catch the killer croc. And he's uh, said to be operating and eating people um, in Lake Tanganyika and up a certain river system for the last 30 years. And he's said to be about five and a half meters long. There are rumors of a six meter cro now crocodile from the Zambezi River, but I can't find any exact proof on that. But to give you an idea, I mean, the biggest crocodile I've seen in the Mara River is probably about four and a half meters. So I'm going to use this as the end. I'm going to walk towards you, Craig. Actually, we need something. We need something. I know what I'll get. There we go. Um, we'll get the sausage as the base. There we go. So you can see how long it is I'm talking. Actually, I might even go get a tape measure from the tech room to show you how long I'm talking. That might be a nice way to show rather than walking it out. So one, two, three, four, and a bit. That's probably about the biggest crocodile we have uh, that I've seen in the Mara. 
um, maybe let's say four, no, four and a half meters. Now, the biggest crocodile I've ever seen in my life is, uh, was a crocodile called Mampande. And he was named, he was caught, he was on a crocodile farm. He was caught in the Mampande Rapids on the Zambezi River. Now, the Mampande Rapids are north of Lake Victoria. I mean, I've checked Victoria Falls, not Lake Victoria. And um, we measured him. Um, and he was missing the bottom third of his tail, and he was 5.1 meters without that bottom third of his tail, and that's the biggest crocodile. And he probably weighed about 1,200 kilograms. So crocs can get over a ton, but the biggest known crocodile, official, um, dead, measured, weighed, was uh, from Point Noa, which is where the Congo River goes out into the sea. And he was actually taken down by security forces in a joint operation because in a very short time he ate about seven or eight people around a specific area uh, where people were often in the water loading and unloading boats and he didn't have a name his name was just Point Noir which is the uh, the city where he was in he was actually right in the city now crocodiles can be very very old and there's some very very big crocodiles in captivity throughout uh, throughout the world most of them belong to the 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 genus uh, cirrhosis croc yeah crocodilus which is um, the the australian saltwater cro or the indo indo pacific saltwater crocodile and they do get bigger and heavier than Nile crocodiles and there are rumors that there's one that lives in papua new guinea and uh, he's said to be close on seven meters long. So, wow, seven meters. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a tape measure for the next segment and show you. And um, the, the biggest in captivity is just over six meters and it's in the Philippines and was caught actually right on the edge of a very big city and was also a man eater. Now, there were a lot of people who, who tried to get that crocodile re-released into the wild, um, but unfortunately, uh, the Filipino government and stuff which sort of makes sense that it, even if you release them in a remote area, there's still people living there, and he would still pose a threat to the people living along the edges of that river. And that was just over six meters. But he died, unfortunately, um, from pneumonia, of all things, in captivity. Apparently, he wasn't kept in very good conditions. But our crocodiles here in the Mara are in wonderful condition, and especially at the moment, after all the little beast and zebra swimming across. And... Uh, now, one of the strange things about crocodiles, and a lot of people don't realize it's, it, and it's actually very similar with sharks. If you ever do get attacked by a crocodile, everyone says, go for the eyes. Now, with a crocodile, it's quite difficult just where the eyes are placed. But the real trick is to go for the schnoz. So you go for the crocodile's nose. Now, I will try to get a picture of a crocodile again when I get onto the computer. So if you have a look carefully, if you have a look on a picture of a crocodile that's still got its skin on, there are lots of tiny little black dots all over. And those are actually sensory organs called ciliary glands. And they pick up vibrations in the water. And uh, what happens is if anything comes within 30 centimeters, which is not such a big deal for a big croc who's eating wildebeest, but it picks up the vibrations of catfish and whatnot, and as soon as it's within that range, it snaps closed. Um, but I've been talking so much about crocodiles, I think it's about time we show you some of the crocodiles um, in the Mara, and we've got a little clip prepared so you can see some of the magnificent beasts that have been eating all the little beast and zebra. On the banks and beneath the surface of the Mara River lurks a disreputable reptile. For nature's favorite villain, pickings have been slim for the last nine months. But now, the wait is over. The migration has arrived. The loathsome dinosaurs of the deep slink beneath the muddy surface as the herds approach. Inexorably drawn to the greener pastures on the other side. The buffet table is set. The wait is over. The crossing begins. Wildebeest, zebra, and gazelle are grabbed by the world's most powerful bite. Africa's biggest crocodiles feast like this for weeks. Until the next herd is drawn to the water's edge. These villains of the Mara will bask content in the sun. Welcome back. Wasn't it incredible to see how those 
ancient animals operate along the Mara River. So I um, took that opportunity to jump back to the computer. So there we go. I'm trying to, I was trying to find a bigger picture, but that is the largest 100% known crocodile from from Africa, from the Nile, well, from from the Congo River, Point Noir crocodile, 5.4 meters, 17.71 feet, and um, it doesn't have a weight, but you'd probably be close on a thousand kilograms. Now I was talking about where is he now? There's uh, pictures of him. Um, there he is but that might not even be him. Uh, def I don't think it is him judging by the picture. So Gustav is estimated to be at six meters long, and that would make him the largest Nile crocodile ever recorded. There have been saltwater crocs that have been recorded over that length, but never a Nile crocodile. And um, he lives in a very cool part of the world, and all my tabs are gone, sorry. Let me just do this quickly. Um, and he lives on a very specific river in quite a densely populated part of Africa. Um, it's a very small country that's had quite a, a turbulent past called Burundi. Um, and he lives right up in this top section here. And there we go, the Rusizi Delta. So this is where he is rumored to be active. And he goes all the way up, and you can see these are really built up areas so people utilize this delta a lot for fishing and you can see that dirty water would make it very easy for him to make snacks of people now of course in the Mara not only the Mara River has very big crocodiles I have seen crocodiles of close on four meters in some of the little luggers now Jamie is ready to show you a lugger but I don't think there's a crocodile in it at the moment Well, not that we know of anyway. I think, in fact, it's relatively certain that there's no crocodile in the slugger. But it's fascinating after all of this rain to witness the sheer power of the water that runs through these otherwise completely dry and empty luggers. And I always looked at them and I thought, sort of in the back of my mind and wondered at just how deep they are and just how steep the sides are. And then when you see water flowing along like this, it actually really completely makes sense as to just how powerfully the water comes down when it does come down. And if you listen just for a second, you can hear how fast it's flowing. quite extraordinary. Not the Mara River, just one random lugger that we drive past most of the time without stopping. The only thing that really has ever brought it to my notice is the fact that the hyenas like to sleep here, next to the road. But there you go. The nice thing, of course, about all of this rain is that it clears everything up and it makes for some of the most spectacular sunsets. And this golden light that is shining out over the escarpment, the clouds haven't cleared enough for us to properly see the sun, but we really do have the most spectacular scenery. That's where the storm came from, or around about where the storm came from. It barreled its way from the south along the escarpment. That, of course, is west because that's where the sun sets, but you get the idea. Isn't it lovely? Of course, we love the scenery here in the Mara, but it's not all about the pretty scenery. Sometimes we have to show you some animals at the same time. Let's go out what little site Taylor has found. I've got a sighting that kind of touches most of the senses. Firstly, it's very appealing to the eyes. On the wetland, well, it's now a wetland, and then a and, and the sun about to set. But that's not all. Uh, we don't just have this beautiful sight. The sound that is being emitted from the water is incredible too. So we're going to have to listen for a little bit as well.
and this is one of my absolute favorite things to do is to sit and listen to the sounds of the bush there's nothing quite like it and i made a the bush here is very very quiet and that is not true after the rains have fallen it is unbelievable how everything just comes alive and these particular areas that are filled with water and now provide an entire habitat for frogs and birds and lots of other things it really and truly is is incredible so to get a site like this and to hear the egyptian geese to hear the white rod kukuls the two main frog species that i can hear are bubbling casinas that's it and then there's the other constant sort of click the chatter that is from a butcher's caco a tiny little frog the cacos and hopefully a little bit later we will see them martina you say what wonderful sounds martina would you believe me that i often record the sounds of nature just on my phone and when I'm feeling stressed and frustrated or I just need a time out, I'll often plug my headphones in, pick up a book or do something that is going to settle me down. But listen to the sounds of either a dawn chorus or a chorus like this, just sort of ambient sound that you get when you're out in the bush. And it's honestly the quickest way uh, to, to settle myself down. Well, that's, what I, that's a technique that I use. Should we have another little listen? I think we should. Well, I'd like to have a, a little listen again. doing this more. Okay, yeah, I love it. I think we need to try and make the most of it, especially because the Juma and the Mara are so different at the moment in terms of obviously Juma being the peak of the drought and us getting the early rains that you have in this area. So it's really, really nice to be able to, you know, sit and listen to the birds and see the dry scenery and then come here and see the lush vegetation and look who's just stopped in front of us off to the left to have a drink of water as well Isn't that a nice little surprise a water buck perfectly suited to the wetlands to the marshes to the rivers that's of course why they have one of well, their name one of the reasons not worried about getting ankle deep into the water, feeding on the tastiest of grasses, splashing about. If you're lucky, you might even see the odd frog that's been churned up every now and then. Where are our mating bullfrogs? That's what we really need to see. And I think if we come back here in about an hour or so, actually, well, that might be the end of the show. You know, I think if we sit here, plan to be here for the end of the show, we could do some really cool frogging with a spotlight and see what we can pick up. I really want to show you a common, not a common caco, not a butkers caco either, because they're so tiny. But what I would like to show you is the bubbling casinas. I don't know if we've ever put one on camera before. They're elusive. You hear them calling, but you very rarely see them. I've only seen a few in my life and I've actually had to go out and catch them with nets and running around doing all sorts of things because what I've done it since I was a little girl and they're the most beautiful beautiful frogs and if you're lucky maybe Brent can even show you one in the studio if we don't get to see one but let's see if we can actually find one for ourselves that would be of course the the best reward and I wonder if any herons and things are going to come and fish here later tonight which would be quite nice uh, to actually see. Maybe we do get some, I don't know if you get uh, black crown night herons or squacker herons. I'm actually I'm not sure if you see any of them around there. Or greenback herons, maybe even a black-headed heron fishing later into the evening, but we'll come and have a look. But for now, it seems as though Tristan's still with his leopard. I don't think he's going to leave it just yet. And I wonder what Shadow is planning on getting up to this evening. and we sat on this side. Sorry about that. I believe we had some gremlins as well. I was just saying, when we got around this side, both VM and I, as soon as we went off air, were both looking at one another saying, this 
tiny it looks like shadow and so i know a lot of you have also commented on it so it is indeed shadow so i do apologize for calling it tiny the first view we had was not very pleasant at all and now that we can see her properly it is most definitely her about an interesting conversation which is shadow doing in the and why is she exactly where Tandi keeps being seen? So Tandi, we've seen her a lot in this area, and all of a sudden Shadow is now in this section as well. And this is the furthest east I've seen Shadow in the entire time I've been here at Safari Live. So I don't know what she's doing this side and how often she comes here. Maybe she's here a lot more than we even realise, and she just hides. That's why we. But seriously interesting and it just goes to show how both the girls now are pushing as much as they can into the heart of what was once Karuna's territory to try and take over. So as well so interesting and I'm pretty sure the two of them are going to come to blows at some point there's no ways that we're going to see a situation where Shadow and Tandi are going to maneuver up and down this Mulawati system without bumping into each other at some point it's they both here well Tandi in particular is here quite often and if Shadow has now decided that this is an area she wants to spend more time then there's going to be a day where they are going to meet up at some point we have seen Tandi in this area and Weaver's Nest And I would love to be here when that altercation takes place or when that sort of meeting up takes place. It might be quite civil. Who knows? Tristan again, but it's just one of those things, it's where he is, or at least where Shadow has chosen to be for the evening, it just makes it a little bit of a tricky spot. I've just realized what a disaster my hair is. I promise you it was all neatly brushed and everything before the storm, and then the storm hit and Taylor and myself were wrapping up the cars in the wind. Obviously, it ended up in a complete rat's nest. Whoopsie. Oh well, we tried. We were battling, battling the elements. Standing, all of us standing in the kitchen drinking tea as the wind howled around us. And we all wondered about whether or not the tents were actually going to blow away. Ah, oh, James Richard, I haven't had a chance yet. My day just went from busy to even, even busier. And I haven't had a chance to ID the mystery raptor, although funny you should mention it because we're not far away from where we saw it. I started to think of maybe juvenile western, western banded snake eagle was one of my guesses, but I still need to confirm it. I, thank you for all for sending through your screenshots of the mystery brownish raptor. Um, it could belong to the buzzard family, but it was a little bit big. I'm still not 100% sure, and I still haven't had the opportunity to get second opinions. So while I didn't forget about it, I just honestly did not have a chance today. It was just one of those days. You see, Brent and I are planning a, a trip to Uganda to go white water rafting, but that obviously means sorting out visas and everything like that. So my day went from end of drive meeting, Safari Live story filming on the elephant to talk about exactly what happened with the little baby elephant and then straight into trying to book that and then the, the chaos of the storm hit us. Riti, we do. We do have crows here. You don't really see them in the Mara itself and you'll find that the, the same applies to Juma. Um, usually the crows tend to gather in places where there are people because where there is where there are people there's rubbish essentially and crows have become very specialized in terms of scavenging of human waste whether it's food waste or whatever else they happen to gather so we do see crows but we tend to see them outside of the of the reserve itself which of course speaks volumes because it means that there's there's no rubbish around but we do see crows around every now and again 
And if you go, if you travel further toward into Kenya, then you will see crows. And I've seen one or two. One of them arrived randomly in the middle of our camp the one day. Not because there's lots of rubbish around, obviously. But one of them did come to visit us. You know what I did see? Actually, I'm not even going to stop and show you a picture because I was so excited. I even phoned Taylor to come out and see. She was the only person still around. But I phoned Taylor to call her because the Rosses Tarakos live around our camp. And I'll show you in a second. Give me one moment. So the Rosses Tarakos live around our camp. And they came out so beautifully for us. Oh, you can see I was looking at raptors. Tarako, there we go. These guys were out in the open because they were so soggy that they came out and they were doing their mating display while they were drying themselves off out in the open. And they are utterly exquisite, very large birds. Turaco is, of course, named for the pigment that is found within their feathers. Technically, the only birds with proper true red and green pigments. The other birds create those colors by an overlay of different pigments and reflection of light. Now if we play the call, that's what we wake up to every morning. You get the idea, it gets repetitive after a while, but that's, that's the sound that they make. I'm looking for the second part of their call. Skip ahead. No, no, we're still on that part. That's what they were doing with each other. It was very cool. So it's one of my deep desires is to get a Ross's Turaco on camera for all of you. I tried it the other morning when we stopped up on the when we started the, the show on the on the top of the mountain. I tried to find them. And unfortunately that one morning they weren't out in the open, but they are very secretive birds and they like to live deep in the foliage of trees. One day. It was very funny because we were watching Elka trying to stalk them with her camera. It's hilarious. Right, well, with all of this rain and with all of the water that's about, I feel it is somewhat inevitable that we should talk a little bit more about the dinosaurs of the water. Well, hopefully, while we're white water rafting down the Nile, we don't end up like this. Because there are some big crocodiles in the Nile. But generally, those big crocs are going to avoid that heavy white water. Now, Gustav is supposed to be the biggest Nile crocodile in existence and the largest Nile crocodile in Africa. So he is said to be estimated at six meters. Um, some people say he's seven and a half meters. I think that might be a fishing story. But Craig and I have devised a method to try and give you an idea of how big that really is. So we're not sure if it's going to work, so we do apologize. Craig, are you ready? This is the most interactive Batman has ever been. Here we go, Batman. Have you got the tape measure? Okay, so off we go. So I'm going, and the studio isn't even big enough, so I'm going to have to go out the door. But Batman, drop the tape measure. Let's try that again, Batman. Okay. So we're going to six meters, which is what Gustav is estimated at. Now, to give you an idea, I'm only at five and a half meters now. Oh, I'll give it a go up more. Oh, here we go. And what am I at? There we go. Okay, wait, I went too far. Oh, I went too far. Oh, no. Okay, so there is six meters. And um, some people estimate Gustav to be longer than this tape measure. But I don't think so. I think six meters is probably even a little bit too long for what Gustav is. Batman, you dropped it again. Oh, yeah, I'm coming back now. Back inside. Oh, dirty feet on the James's carpet. Okay, here we go. It's quite cold out there. I should have taken my sugar. But that's absolutely massive. So at six meters, he probably weighs around 1,200 to 1,400 kilograms. Thank you, Martin and tech team, for the tape measure. Well, Octo Gurley is wondering, do crocodiles have 
Oh, I don't know what, how safe this is. There we go. Um, it is very safe because it's my fishing line and I don't use bad fishing line. Um, Octo Girl is wondering, do crocodiles have a preference for fast or slow moving water? Now it completely depends on the crocodile. Now I've seen crocodiles in very fast flowing water in the Mara. I've seen them in very slow flowing water in the Mara. Um, I've seen them in fast water in the Zambezi, slow water in the Zambezi. Generally, your giants, your really big crocodiles prefer the slower moving pools. Now your smaller crocodiles, and especially your little ones, lack the fast moving water. Lots of little fish, lots of little insects. And the main reason they like those areas is because the big ones don't. Now crocodiles will eat each other. And uh, one of the biggest challenges a mother crocodile faces is keeping the big males, like this gentleman right here, away from the new hatchlings. So they will absolutely eat um, there, even if they've sired them. A little crocodile wonders near a big male, wonders near a female that's not its mother and they will eat them. And one of the more interesting things about crocodiles is also in their oil or their fat, there is a, a very, very unique thing that, um, well, uh, we, did, we broke up during that there, Fate, so can we have it again, please? Um, so one of the things is they are able to regenerate limbs to a certain degree, and they can actually recover um, from injuries a lot faster. Now, Safari Wildman, crocs are prehistoric. We are so lucky to see them and we should preserve them. Agreed 100%. And it's amazing in the last 100 years how the attitude towards crocodiles and especially um, crocodiles in places like Africa and Asia have changed. And whereas we do have the biggest crocodiles with the Nile and the salt waters, all the Indo Pacifics. But as I was saying, so the, the, the fat in, in, and the oil that you can obtain from a crocodile is, is, is absolutely incredible. So if you've ever got a scar, um, you, you use vitamin E oil to try to hide the scar or whatnot. Now, crocodile oil and fat is highly sought after in local cultures because of its, its, its incredible medicinal properties. Now, I happen to get a third degree burn while I was working in, in, in Zambia on a crocodile farm and I put crocodile oil on it and I can't see, can you see there Craig? It's all, I think it's almost gone but there's actually a third degree burn from a motorcycle there and it's almost invisible and I did put croc oil on it and it worked far better than vitamin E oil. So it is incredible and they are to a certain degree able to regenerate um, limbs but sometimes not fully. So well, quite a few reptiles can do it but it's amazing that an animal this size is still able to do it. And I actually do have quite a soft spot for crocs. Um, having caught quite a few of them in my youth. Um, one of the things about growing up in the, in, in the Okavango in Botswana, one of the, your, your games was to go out at night with a spotlight and uh, catch crocodiles. We did let them go and we did not hurt them. Um, well, the one thing I definitely did not try catch or jump on was leopards. So let's go find out how the leopard's doing with Tristan. Well, yes, I don't think touching a leopard would be a fine idea, particularly not a very sleepy shadow. I would imagine she would be quite upset if you were to go and touch her. She's been hissing every now and then at flies that are landing at her, so on her, so I'd imagine a hand of a person will not go down well at all. But hopefully we will get our signal story right and we can actually spend some time. She's fast, fast asleep. Nothing has really disturbed her. She's lying in a prime position, though, if anything is around that they will probably in all likelihood stumble quite close to her before actually spotting her she's in dense deep thickets we've got a nice little window of view where we are but all around her is thick and and full of brush and so if any prey animal walks in this area at this time of the day we can expect those kind of animals to be moving around so things like nyala and steenbok and daiker and impalas or might be crossing the Mulawati and getting out of the Mulawati and, and there might be a bit of movement straight towards her. So she's in prime position in terms of that. Also, she's in a great place just for a bit of shade. It's now starting to cool down quite a bit though. We're seeing the sun starting to get to the horizon and I would imagine that Shadow will be up and moving fairly shortly. I don't think she's going to be down for too long. She's a cat that generally is quite busy. So her and Tandy, they're both very similar in that they tend to move a lot is I've had very few sightings of them just sleeping for entire drives they mostly get up and move a little bit so hopefully shadow will get up now what amazes me is the rate of absorption that leopards and, and lions and big cats have we know that she was on a rather large impala kill how many days ago now two days ago two days 
And look at how that stomach is already sucking in. So if we had seen her and we hadn't known that she had had this meal two days ago, we might have thought maybe she was a little bit on the hungry side. But she's actually just come off a really nice meal. And so she's actually still going to do just what you can see. She's having a really good stretch as well, just realigning everything. So that's an indication that she's not going to be moving any time in the next few minutes we're going to have a situation where she'll probably stretch a little bit she might roll and only once that sun hits the horizon and it gets a little darker do i think we're going to see her starting to yawn and getting up and moving ultimately she must have walked during the hot part of the day today given that her tracks were on top of all the vehicle tracks from this morning it means that she was moving around when it was still quite warm so she'll be a bit fatigued from that and that's why she's going to have her head tucked down and sleeping for a while and Hopefully she will get up before our drive is finished and we can follow and see where she actually goes because I'm intrigued to see if she goes further east or if she turns back to the west. She's got a convenient little ottoman in the shape of an elephant dropping that she's also got her foot rested nicely on as well. And so when lounging about it's important to have the comforts of ottomans and various other cushioning factors for one's paw. So Shadow is just showing her sort of more ladylike side. Liz, to be honest, haven't seen either Shadow or Tundi sawing since they since Karula has left. We hear it every now and then, and, and like I say the other day, I'm I'm 100% sure we heard a female sawing. Whether it was Tundi or Shadow is anyone's guess. We, if you had told me before today, I would have predicted as we did the whole afternoon that this was an area that Tundi spent time in and not um, Shadow. And so, who knows, maybe both of them are walking in this area and it could have been either one that was sawing. But... I would imagine we'll hear it more when they start coming to estresses or if they start if they're pregnant and they're developing den areas then we're going to hear a lot more of it and and hopefully we'll actually be able to see them doing it and document them doing it but i honestly haven't heard them really going at it too much just yet now she's looking because there walks a tortoise which vm has now spotted so she's watching the tortoise walking along so from one leopard to another she's not too concerned though by the tortoise she kind of watched it for a bit and she almost looks as though she's starting to fall asleep now as well but sometimes tortoises will get leopards moving and get them kind of intrigued and they'll go play around a bit with them and try and see if they can munch away and get into some part of it to feed but she seems as though she's too tired for that right now if her cub was here i would have no doubt that the cub would have been bounding along and pouncing onto said tortoise but you can see shadow has decided nothing of that i'm going to rather rest and conserve my energy for proper food items this evening but I wonder what that little mark is on her face there. I'm quite intrigued as to what it actually is and why she had it and what's caused it. It's a very strange shape. But generally, out here, most of the markings that you see on a leopard are um, linear in shape. So it's either a scrape from a branch or a cut or something like that. Whereas this is more kind of a rounded shape, so quite interesting to see. Glasses. Sorry, what's that? Imprint from, her Imprint from her glasses. Did you think she borrowed Byron's? Could be, Could be yes. If Byron was looking for his, sung, for his glasses, that maybe Shadow has been wearing his glasses too much and has now got a little mark on the edge of the nose. <laughs> of course, that's probably not true in any way whatsoever, but interesting little mark, and it certainly will help with identifying Shadow. I get it wrong all the time as we've seen this afternoon and well my track record this week is something horrific with shadow i don't know why i misidentified her prey item that she had the other day i've misidentified her today it's a tough week really i'm gonna have to sharpen up a little bit and get myself sorted yep there's megan is reminding me nyala and impala story and like i say now i've misidentified her as well Oopsie. Oh well, it's okay. Shadow doesn't seem to be too fussed by it at all, and so hopefully she will forgive me and won't come and try and give me trouble about it as much as what Byron has. No, well, I'm not sure if she enjoys our well, my voice or any of the, the guide's voices. Um, she seems to be fairly relaxed around us, so the sound of my voice can't be too perturbing to her. It must be a situation where she's kind of, you know, used to the sound of people talking and whether or not she knows my voice 
is debatable. I would imagine and I would like to give the benefit of the doubt to leopards in that they are intelligent animals enough to discern different sounds and the fact that they're able to pick up rustling in the grass from so far would mean that I'm pretty sure they can pick up different tones and different sort of patterns or, or wavelengths of sound and that maybe she does recognize my voice and uh, I don't know I don't I mean I don't know if she can pinpoint it to a person but she certainly doesn't seem to be too phased by my voice and and none of the any of the other guides does she seem to worry about too much and um, all the leopards though I like I say I give them enough credits in that they're intelligent enough to process a sound and know that the sound is a non-threatening one whether they know exactly who I am is a different story altogether but they do know that I'm in this vehicle I make a noise and I'm non-threatening in this particular situation and so that maybe that applies to all guides and maybe they think that just different vehicles have different voices but it's interesting I the reason why I often think about these things and why I think that leopards do pick up slight changes in in voices and and can definitely hear changes in tone and those kind of things is I've seen leopards behave differently with be different vehicles in, in in the same sighting so I've seen vehicles coming in and a leopard sleeping like this and then all of a sudden another ranger coming in or guide and the leopard's behavior compl changes completely where it becomes shy and reclusive and skittish so I don't know maybe they can maybe they have a knowledge of certain things and certain instances or instances will remind them and they'll then be a little bit more kind of I don't know what the word is, wary or comfortable within a certain tonal range of, of what they hear. I don't know, interesting study, it would be it would be nice to know. Uh, if you look at domestic cats and, and you see how they respond to their owner's voice as opposed to others, it gives an indication that they should be able to tell the difference between the two. Whether they care or not is also anyone's guess in terms of a wild animal. What I can tell you though is that Shadow is completely not phased by my voice this afternoon at all. She's having a nice little nap and it's, it's actually very pleasant watching her and just sitting and spending time with her. We're in this, such a beautiful part of Juma. We're in this kind of dense thicket. There's spike thorns all around us, beautiful big trees in the forms of jackalberries and the sun is setting, there's birds calling. It's a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. And also, we're being absolutely spoilt in that it's just myself and VM here. There's no other vehicles that have even come close because of where she's lying. It's really difficult for the other vehicles to get in here. And so we're being spoilt. It's just, it's a serene situation and a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. I've thoroughly enjoyed every second of spending time with Shadow. And it seems as though she might slowly, slowly start to wake up. Every now and then we're going to get a situation where her kind of eyes are going to open every now and then and her head is going to lift and she's not 100% asleep which is good news for us and means that hopefully she will decide to start getting up and grooming and if we see her sit up and groom and, and start to actually and look at that look at those eyes beautiful um if she starts to groom then we know that she's going to start probably moving and I, I would hazard a guess that she's going to get up and head back westwards but you never know it will be interesting to see how far east she does push if she does decide to move tonight and that's why i would like to stay with her is just to decode the pattern a little bit further and to try and work it out because ultimately it's going to be an interesting few months as her and, and tundi kind of establish a boundary between the two of them because they're starting to overlap quite a bit now and so i'm interested to see who kind of draws the line and what that entails whether there's going to be scent marking or vocalizing or if shadow tonight just gets up and walks westwards without doing any of that i'm not quite sure maybe she just found a nice place to sleep and lie down and she's not going to mark and she's going to head back into her territory interesting so it's worth sitting around and it's worth sitting with her sleeping she's still at the end of the day a magnificent individual and animal and beautiful to look at whether she's sleeping or awake it's still a wonderful animal just to spend time around so certainly very happy where i am and hopefully you're all enjoying it at home as well amazing also to see how slow her breathing is in comparison to what we saw the other day the other morning when she was feeding when we first found her with her carcass she had such a big full belly that her rate of breathing was quite fast mouth was open panting we saw the same thing with Osana whereas now her rate of breathing is fairly static and normal mouth is closed she really isn't kind of panting even though it is a warm afternoon the wind has completely died down now there's no more wind and so her you know she's not getting cooled by that it's just that without that amount of food in her stomach it's not pushing up on the lungs and therefore she doesn't have to worry about breathing as fast but 
absolutely wonderful. That's about as sleepy a cat as you could ask for, I would say. Although, Hosanna did rival her the other afternoon when he slept all the way through until it started getting dark. And like I said, the sun is starting to kind of dip down below the horizon now. So in the Mulawati system where we are, it's all shadowed now. There's no sunlight anywhere. And, and the sun itself, I've actually, we no longer can see it. It's kind of just dipped. I can just see the glow of yellow on the horizon at the moment. And it's kind of a situation where you can see there it's just dipping down and so the sunset is happening it's cooling and i'm sure shadow is going to be picking up that there's a change the, the diurnal animals are going to start getting a little bit more in the situation where they're going to quiet down and then the nocturnals are going to start and maybe that will be the trigger for shadow to get up and start moving and, and we saw the other day with Fosana that it took quite some time for him to wake up even after the sun had set it took him i would say probably a good 15 20 minutes after the sunset for him to actually get up and start being active so i'm sure we're going to see a similar thing from her Hello beautiful girl, look at that, she's getting a bit more wide-eyed now and eyes have been opening up a little bit more so we're going to sit patiently with her and hope that she's going to get up just now and while we do that I believe Jamie Patterson is bumbling about the Mara with her spotlight looking for all kinds of little critters in the night. We continue on into the darkness in search of something exciting to show you. I do have something exciting to tell you, though. I think it's exciting. I'm not really sure. But earlier on, we drove past, but far away, we drove past where that cheetah, where Brent found that cheetah den. Now, I don't know exactly what it was, but something really upset the elephants, to the point that one was chasing something. I couldn't see what. We were too far away but chasing something. It could have been a hyena, it could have been a lion, but it could also, it seemed like a bit of a coincidence at this time of day, right below her cheetah, the cheetah's den. I find myself daring to hope that she's still somewhere in that region with those cubs. Elephants, as a general rule, don't like predators. They chase them, they don't like the smell, they don't like their presence. And this elephant was definitely upset about something. And unfortunately, because of all the rain that we've had, all but the main roads are closed. And but you saw all the water that was coming down from the escarpment. I don't really want to try and drive there this evening. Otherwise, I'll get the double marshmallow title, and I really don't want that. Can't have it twice in a row. That's just sad. Are we talking specific individual animals or species of animal? I really, I, I always have, I really love black rhino and that applies in South Africa and in the Masai Mara. Um, I also always love spending time with elephants, there'll always be something special. What have we got here? You look like a little antelope of some description. Just take the light off in case it is. So I'm just gonna check it. Let's have a look. Oh, oh, it's stuck down now. Let's see if we can spot it again and work out what it is. It's difficult with the infrared light. So over there, and we're gonna have a look. So Jahawi's gonna help me to have a look there and see if we can find what it is. Let's have a look. I think it looks like a little antelope, so I'm just going to drop my spotlight down a bit. It's right on the edge there, at the top of the spotlight beam. There we go. Somewhere there, there is something. Hmm. It has vanished. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. Just want to check and make sure it's not a serval. There, there, there we go. Well done. I saw something there. Little head pop up. Um, if you zoom in right there somewhere, maybe up a little bit, somewhere there, I think whatever it is, oh, there we go, there we go, oh, it's a little antelope, sorry little antelope to disturb you, all right, so if I take my spotlight away, it's going to be impossible to see it, a little antelope in the long grass, 
They're tricky that way. They really do. They keep us guessing. Because that's exactly what a serval looks like. What were we talking about? Oh yes, favorite animals. In terms of favorite individuals, I'm naturally inclined to say the little pale lioness cub just because I've spent quite a bit of time with her and I've seen her character develop, or to me, what I've seen as, as character development. It's probably, I think, because she stands out so clearly and I have spent so much time with her, but I really do enjoy her. Otherwise, to be 100% honest with you, I haven't spent enough time with other animals to have properly formed a a, an individual favorite yet. I can tell you that my favorite leopard on Juma is, Tund is Tundi, and of course, Tristan's favorite animal is the leopard, so let's go back across to Tundi's sister and Tristan's favorite animal. Indeed, it is my favorite animal, Jamie, and we have a shared favorite in Tundi, but Shadow is also a, a lovely leopard to spend time around. I, I do enjoy, actually, I've had some cool Shadow sightings, and I thoroughly enjoyed spending a little bit more time with her than what we did when I was at Simomili. We didn't get to see her all that often, so she was a situation where she would um, spend a lot of time on this side or in Hoffmans, and so we really didn't get to spend that much time with her. So it's been quite nice to see her a little bit more regularly, and especially over the last couple of weeks or months, should I say, we've been seeing Shadow a lot more. And you can see she's starting to do the typical cute cat roll which really is very very nice to see and look at that oh, isn't that wonderful when she kind of looks at us over the sort of top of her eyes it is beautiful when they do that I always love when they do that and I think this might be a sort of start of her waking up there's another vehicle that's just joining us for the afternoon so I think that might trigger her to maybe just maybe start waking up a little bit and start getting into a situation where she's thinking about moving and thinking about maybe waking up and going on a patrol i certainly hope so it would be really nice to like i say follow her around and see what goes on but back to the pose again and back to being a sleepy cat now that the vehicle's turned off so still not quite ready just yet I was saying earlier, if we start to see her grooming, that's normally a good indication that she's going to start moving. Once they groom and they yawn, it's a fairly quick process, and then they're up and going. They're not quite like the lions when the lions groom and roar and, and end up with um, yawning, and it's sometimes they get up and they'll walk five meters and flop back down again, whereas the leopards tend to be a little bit more kind of mobile in that regard. They, they do it quickly, and then they're up and moving and looking around for things. And this is the time of day where leopards generally are far more active and so they are a lot more crepuscular than what they are nocturnal so for those of you that are new to the show and don't know what crepuscular means and, and why we say leopards are crepuscular well crepuscular basically is an animal that is active around dawn and dusk and so leopards heightened period of activity much like um, wild dogs and, and cheetahs generally around those periods around the sunset and sunrise times but generally after the sun is set and just before the sun has risen so it's still darkness but it's when they like to be moving and it's why safaris are often sort of at that time because you can catch both the predators and the prey animals all getting active at the similar time whereas something like you know a nocturnal animal would be more something like hyenas or bush babies civets genets which you really seldom see during the day these guys we have seen them active during the day and even like i say around sunset and sunrise is generally when we see the peak amounts of activity from these guys now i believe that you guys stopped and you listened to the frogs of the mara and that some of you would like to hear the sounds of juma well we can't I'll stop talking and we'll turn up the ambient mic and just have a little listen around. There's not really much calling at the moment. We're not near any water, so we won't hear the frogs, but there might be a few birds that will call, and that's probably about it. There'll be a few Franklins and guinea fowls, but we'll listen anyway and just see what there is and see how we go.
like I was saying, is not as noisy as maybe what Taylor would have had. If we'd been near water, we probably would have heard a lot more. There's the odd Franklin calling in the background, a couple of crested Franklins that have been calling. But other than that, it's really at that stage of the day where it's quiet. And so we've got a situation where not too much is happening from the diurnal animals. They're all starting to sleep. The nocturnals haven't quite woken up, although you can see Shadow, she's popped her head up. She's starting to yawn now, so I think we might be on the move shortly. I don't think we're going to be down for too much longer. Hopefully we'll be up and moving and following around our tortoise. Maybe it will get some interaction between the tortoise and Shadow. That'll be quite fun to watch. I think it'll be quite entertaining just to see how it goes. That tortoise is quite a big one, and so I would maybe think that it'll probably be a little on the large side for Shadow to be able to consume it. But while we wait and we see what Shadow gets up to and goes on and whether she decides to start her maneuvering around Juma, let's go back to the Brent Leo Smith who will be full of noises himself. My crocodiles keep falling off. So apparently we do have a few more crocodile questions. And it has been fun talking about the Nile crocodile. Now, while I wait for the questions to come in, um, I'm going to ask you a question back. And uh, it is to do with my friends. Oh, my fingers are too fat. Well, I can do it on my pinky. <laughs> about my friend, the Nile crocodile. And uh, there is a very famous author who told some... And uh, they were set, or well, one of them was set in particular. Greasy Limpopo River, all beset with fever trees. So who can tell me which just so story and who is the author um, about that wonderful story that involved a crocodile and elephant? Hashtag Safari Live, if you know the answer to that who wrote, on the banks of the great, grey, green, greasy Limpopo, all beset with fever trees. I never get tired of saying that little quote. Now, since we've been crocodile-focused, um, I have a, a sort of a photographic muse, and he's actually an incredible human being, and he is still alive, and he's survived being whacked by an elephant. He's been survived lots of things. And I think probably my favourite photograph um, of, that involves an owl crocodile, it is a bit scary though, so be warned, is this one by um, an American photographer who actually spent a lot of time in Kenya. His name is Peter Beard, and he went along on a scientific expedition up to Lake Takana in northern Kenya, uh, where they were shooting crocodiles and doing scientific research on them, and uh, he posed for this picture and he set it up on a timer where he actually managed to force his whole body in there. I just think it's an incredible, incredible visual piece of art and he is by far my most favorite photographer. I actually have all of his books and um, if you want to have a look at some incredible photos, they are amazing. His name is Peter Beard. He'll spend a lot of time in the Mara. Ah, a very, very good question, specifically since we have quite a few crocodile nests around at the moment, is from Alana, who's 14 years old. And what is the survival rate um, for a nest of baby crocodiles? So it is actually, you probably on average have between 80 and, a, or between 80 and 110 eggs in a nest, um, depending on the area you're in, some, sometimes a bit smaller, but there's a less than 5% survival ratio from those nests. Now, that is incredible. So. Crocodiles in, in the wild, when you see a crocodile that is, oh, I gave my t tape measure back to the tech team, darn it, but when a crocodile is about 10 or 15 centimeters long, so probably two hands, um, about that long, um, they're probably a year old. Now if they're grown in captivity at the same age, they'll be double that length. So at a year, it takes a very long time. And Gustav, who I was talking about, and I showed you how big he's supposed to be, um, is, was estimated to be over 100 years old. But when the National Geographic um, expedition went to try catch him and stuff, and they did get photographs and footage of him, he had a full set of teeth. And they ain't no 100-year-old crocodile with a full set of teeth. So he was actually estimated at 60, uh, between 50 and 60 years old, just due to the fact that he still had all his teeth. So as the crocodiles get older, although they do regenerate teeth, as they get over 100 years and stuff older, they do not have all those teethies. Now, we have, or one out, we have a question from Susie. 
Uh, hi, Susie. Susie wants to know, on average, how many years does a crocodile live? Now, Susie, um, well, if you take it from when it was born, the average lifespan of a crocodile is not very long because they all get eaten by storks, fishing owls, herons, um, other crocodiles, big catfish. But once they reach sort of two to three meters, um, the average age of a crocodile is quite difficult to determine, but it is generally between probably 70 and 100 years old. Now, we're going to move away from crocodiles, and I do not even know what is in this box. Now, this box was sent to James Henry, fragile, attention James Henry, but it arrived a little bit late, and it is from someone uh, some of you might know quite well. It is from Scott's better half, Nicola Austin, and she sent it from Samburu in northern Kenya, and it says fragile, some sinew from Samburu for your collection. So I'm quite excited to see what's in it. Uh, sorry, James, I know you would have also loved to see what's in it. We had some bubble wrap. Doesn't smell too bad. Ooh, there we go. We have a little. Ah, uh, very interesting. Well, there's quite a lot of sinew, Nicola. That's a very, very interesting little skull. Now, I know I already asked you one question, so I don't want to ask you another question, but I know what it is and just by looking at it. But that is incredible. I can tell you, I'm not, at certain times of the night, I'm not particularly fond of this particular creature. I try poses. Oh, there's still quite a lot of sinew. We don't want to break it. It is fragile. We'll just have to let nature take its course. So it doesn't normally sit with its mouth open like that. Normally it would be closed. But I think just the way it has gone, and there's still quite a bit of sinew attached. But, um, I know I'm not supposed to ask you guys two questions in one segment, but I cannot help myself since I opened the box. Um, what do you think that is? Hashtag Safari Live. Thank you, Nicola Austin. I hope you're watching. Uh, a present from Nikki. And look at amazing, look at these canines. How amazing are these canines? The front long canines do give it a little bit of a clue. Well, well done to Kestrel Fox. Now I don't see, feel so bad by asking two questions in, at the same time. Uh, Kestrel Fox, you are spot on. Um, it is Rudyard Kipling. Now, I wonder if Nicola also realized not only did she send us uh, the skull, but she sent us an exoskeleton of a, a spider. I'm not sure which type of spider, but right in the eye socket, there is a little... Shall I get a torch, Craig? Mm. I do have my torch here. There we go. It is a little bit smelly. Oh, but we'll have a look what's in the eye socket of the mystery beast shortly. But it sounds like Tristan's got leopard on the move. We do indeed. You can see Shadow is moving and she's heading straight south. So I think she's going to go to Twin Dams. That's where we're walking now. We're down in the dip at the moment and we're going to head straight southwards towards the dam itself. So I think she'll go for a drink and then from there is anyone's guess. I'm pretty sure from there she might head southwards into Little Gauri, maybe back towards where the cub is. Who knows where the cub actually is at the moment. So the cub could be south of us and she's going to carry on or she could take a westward along the sort of fire break area in that direction. You can see she's sniffing around a little bit. Now there was a number of leopard tracks in this area the last couple days. So we had tracks for a male going north here. There's been tracks for a sauna around this area. So that's maybe why she's just sniffing every now and then, just having a little look at what's going on. You can see the tail's up as well. I was saying to VM, imagine if she went climbing up towards that Wahlberg's eagle nest and started to go for a few eggs. And maybe for dinner, but she didn't. She left the eggs alone and she's now just doing a bit of scent marking so it's going to be interesting i really want to find tundi the next time she comes here before she comes here and finds this because i would be be when she smells the scent marking in this area whether or not she's going to recognize it as shadow is anyone's guess as well going up and so what i do is going to let her go first once she gets up on the top here, generally she should be able to, we should be able to get around her and then we'll go and wait for her at the dam. But you can see her limp, while it is there, is much, much better than it, it, it was a few minutes. 
putting weight on it. It's almost, almost back to normal now. She's kind of got a much better gait than what she had a few months ago. Now, where are you going? Okay, so she is heading straight towards... I'm going to go around them so we can just get her from the front. And that way we can watch her coming towards us rather than going away from us. This area. Now, I apologize for the breakup. It's going to happen a little bit, unfortunately, with where we are and what's going on. Now, you can see there's a very big, prominent path in this direction. So, I'm going to park fairly close to it. So, I'll park here for now, and then I'll just move back when she starts coming around the bend. But this goes straight to where she is. She's just on the other side of that tree over there, and she's walking slowly in our direction. So, if we just patient and we sit where we are, we should get her coming through towards us fairly shortly I would imagine that's at least the theory behind all of this whether or not it's right of course it could be anyone's guess I might have got it completely wrong and she pops out between where I am and the road but anyway it's worth a try I would give that a guess that she's going to use the path of least resistance which is this big game path that we see here of course she might be sniffing around she might be scent marking we saw that she was smelling a bush and scent marking just now and so in all likelihood she might just take a bit of time to get this side there she comes now so she's coming on her way now now Jess and Chloe who are nine years old want to know why do leopards have spots well the reason is is because exactly what we see here so if we zoom in towards that tree you're going to really battle to see her walking and so those spots help for her to hide in a area and to be able to stay very very hidden so that any of the prey animals like impalas and dike and the things that they like to hunt are not able to see it and so it can basically hide in plain sight so the spots help break up the outline of the leopard and make it invisible to those prey animals now I can tell you that shadow is right behind the tree I watched her walking there so she is there and it just goes to show how good her camouflage is just to the right hand side of the tree you'll see you should see her head poking up it might be a little bit too far for VM, but I can see her head directly behind the tree over in that direction there so she's just kind of watching us at the moment she is slowly going to come so she's just on the left hand side of where VM can see so she will come a little bit maybe if I go forward for you VM let me just go forward for VM slightly so he can see her and we can just show you how well they camouflage now here she comes she's coming straight towards us now anyway so there she is on her way straight in this direction now I thought she might follow the game path obviously if she's coming down the game path I need to just move slightly because I don't want to block her and I don't want her to have to go around but isn't that a beautiful view of her look at those little ears flicking with the flies there's quite a few flies around at the moment and so she's coming exactly where I thought she would if I just move slightly we should be actually get a really nice walk by but in fact actually I think we've got some space so that she can just get around us so that's okay it's nice and open where we are there's a nice gap on both sides of me that she can walk so if we sit here we might get a beautiful walk straight towards us at the moment there we go she's coming straight down the path and she's gonna stop and look at that isn't that wonderful and she's taken there's another game path just to my right hand side that she's also could take as well beautiful though and she's got a little tail up just showing everybody that she's not to be shouted at there were a few arrow marked babblers that were beginning to give her a little bit of a hard time and here she goes isn't that great so we chose a good spot that's for sure mm. wonderful that she did come this way now she's gone up behind a tree Swapner, the reason why Shadow has got that little bit of white at the end of her tail is because that is a follow -a me mechanism. So basically, it allows her cubs to see where she is and follow her white tail that contrasts against the shadow of the areas that they like to spend time in these thickets and places like that. So it really massively contrasts against the environment that they're in and it makes it much easier for their little cubs to be able to spot them. Now I'm going to just go around and we'll catch up with her at the water hole because she's heading straight towards Twin Dam. I'm pretty sure she's going to go for her afternoon drink. So she's going to go and just quench that thirst after a hot day and she's probably moved around a little bit. Where is she now? Has she gone down towards? No, there she is. She's standing ever so beautifully. So 
there she comes, she's coming I just want to position ourselves so that we can get a nice view of Shadow drinking and coming towards us. So I'm going to go quite far ahead of her and then just park off. Now it's going to be a little bit of a tilt on the angle and hopefully at the end of the day we're going to have a situation where she does actually drink. So if you just can allow VM to re-steady the camera once I get into this position. Now of course hopefully she doesn't get me and move out. There's actually a water bucket right in front of us. But this is where we're going to park ourselves. Right over here and there comes Shadow slowly but surely so we might go into our infrared because it is getting a little bit dark and like I say VM's just going to level us out before she gets here now she's slowly but surely moving behind a little fallen over branch there and she'll then come out on the other side of that there's a few Egyptian geese which will definitely make sure that they have something to say about what's going on well, there she comes and she should walk then she should come straight towards the water and we should be in prime position to actually be able to see her from where we are and it will be beautiful if we, she does come and drink because it's such a still evening that we should have a situation where we get a beautiful beautiful reflection given she drinks in the right place if she drinks a little bit oh, there she see she spotted this water buck that's behind me and the water buck I think has spotted her so it's a situation where you look at her kind of posture she's far more interested in what's going on in that water buck now there's the water buck on top there's the big male silhouetted against the evening dusk sky and that male probably will have seen where this leopard is there's no lights on her whatsoever so we're not shining lights at all there's another female waterbuck that's actually closer to us just on this right hand side who's aware that something's not right you can see look that female is alert it's bolt upright and shadow i think has decided she's not going to hunt she's got her tail up and is walking straight towards the water so she's showing her tail which is you can see from here how white that tail is and how easy it is to see her so what i was saying with the cubs is the exact same thing now with the antelope she's displaying to them stop shouting at me I'm not interested I just want to come and drink it's hot I'm tired let me just come in and have a good good quench of my thirst but isn't this beautiful now hopefully don't she just comes a little bit more to no she's going to drink where I was thinking that she shouldn't because there's no real there's the water back, but look at the reflection in the water as she goes around. The Egyptian geese, unfortunately, are ruining my reflection a bit, but there we go. And we've got ourselves into a perfect place to have the reflection of shadow as well. Now, because the water back have seen her, I'm just going to put a bit of light just to bring out her coloration, and you can just see a few of those ripples from the Egyptian geese as they've gone along. But how beautiful is that? Now, I was hoping she would drink a little bit closer towards the right of where she is now. So you see where that stick is? I was hoping she would drink on the other side of that because then the, we would have had a full reflection of her face. But, well, it's still beautiful nonetheless. And it's a wonderful thing when you get to see leopards drinking at water holes. It's one of my favorite things to see. And there you go. There's a tail curling backwards as well. And if the Egyptian geese stop and they go onto the bank again, we're going to get far less ripple and you're going to get that reflection really coming out and the reason why I put a bit of light onto the reflection more than anything else I'm actually shining at the water not at her is just to bring out the reflection and so that we can get some beautiful screenshots for all of you guys at home and hopefully it's coming out quite nicely and imagine she's quite a thirsty girl after a day of heat like we've had doesn't actually even look like she's drinking at the moment. It almost looks as though her tongue isn't even touching the water. Tanda, you say she really is a beautiful cat. She is, isn't she? It's, it's, there's something special about seeing a leopard right out in the open like this. So she is a very, very pretty cat, and, and we're incredibly fortunate to be able to see them as the way that we do here in the Sabi Sands and the markings are a leopard are second to none they are exquisite looking animals and really are an unbelievable treat for us here and you can hear the water buck are not running away they're still just snorting so they're warning everybody else we've seen a leopard we've seen a predator don't come here and so the reason why they're not running is because if they run they allow this predator the chance to go somewhere else and hide and then potentially stalk them so rather just stay far away and just let this leopard drink and, and watch them and then as soon as the leopard walks off they can stay in the more open clearing like what we have 
here at Twin Dams rather than running into a thicket and the leopard being able to stalk them. The thing is, is that Tundi, I mean, sorry, Shadow is in no way really going to go after something like a big male water buck. It's just far too powerful for her. She's going to really struggle to be able to go after that. Now, what I'm hoping is she's going to walk along the edge and we're going to get that reflection in the water as she goes along. So it's not quite what I thought, but it's still beautiful nonetheless as she kind of strolls over the bank. But isn't that wonderful? Absolutely beautiful. It's actually quite amazing. She's going straight southwards towards Dilgari. So I think we've got probably about two more or three more minutes with Shadow and she's then going to cross south over the boundary unless she turns to the east. But what I'm going to try and do is just try and get onto the other side and not go into the dam itself and try and just get straight back out and we'll try and get to a point where we can watch Shadow cross southwards over the boundary. Go. Sorry little water buck, I know we're going to disturb you. I apologize. Don't worry, the leopard's not going to eat you tonight. So our water buck I think is more than safe at this stage. That leopard is really not going anywhere near the water buck. I think Shadow is going to not cause too much of a hassle for them. She stopped on the other side there. She's watching these water buck run around and she's probably in a situation where she's thinking, well, I suppose I could try and go after them. Now I'm going to quickly shoot a little bit further round and the reason why is because hopefully she's going to come over the dam wall towards us and we're going to be kind of below her and we get a beautiful view of her up against the evening sky. That's the idea anyway, whether or not it pans out, who knows, but that's what I'm going to hope for as we come around this direction. Of course she can take the dam wall in an east-west direction. Um, but I'm hoping that what's going to happen is, you see where we are now? Now hopefully she's going to come straight up on this ridge here and stand on top there and we're going to be lower than what she is and then we're going to get a very special view of her as she comes up. So that's what I'm hoping anyway. Now I can't see her at the moment. She's somewhere just in this general vicinity but I'm pretty sure she is going to head to where we are now now it's just going to be a patience game as we wait for her to come over and well why not like i say it's it's a beautiful sort of stage that's been set for her to arrive in and so hopefully she will pop out somewhere where we actually can see her on this little ledge and not further down the dam wall on the left or somewhere like that but i would imagine that this is where she's going to head it's, it's pretty much the kind of way she's going she walked up towards that road and the road just pops out right there there she is now so she's just coming up onto the top there so vim do you want some more light there we go so there's a bit of light for vim so that's what i was hoping for is that we'd get her right on the sort of top of that wall and we'd get her at eye level walking along. Isn't that a wonderful view of a leopard? Oh, and so good of you to sit for us as well. And, well, stand for us, should I say, Shadow. You can see she's just looking over her shoulder at those water buck, and then down the hill she's going to go, and slowly but surely southwards towards Little Gari. Now I'm going to just try and reposition and see. We might, like I say, go into infrared just now. We do have our infrared on, so I might just jump into the infrared light because we've got another vehicle with us and it's difficult to actually keep my headlights on. And hmm, I don't quite know actually how we're going to do this because she's going in an area that's quite dense and thick. So what I'm hoping... Okay, she's still coming south, that's fine. Can I still go? Yeah, we good? Yeah. We've slightly gone off-road here by mistake, which means that there's a few branches to worry about. It's just to stop guys going off-road on the sodic section. Now, sodic section is an area of soil that's a little bit on the sensitive side, which is all this white soil on my left. So, just got to try and avoid going over that and then just getting across a little bit further. Now, she should pop out somewhere on my left-hand side. I'm just trying to see where she is. Uh, can you see her? Okay, cool. So it's getting to that time of the day where the light is almost accessible and we can't see anything. So I'm just trying to get into a position where I'm not going to cut her off, but can still see her. Is she just in front here, Vildi?
Oh, there she comes. She's behind us. So <laughs> we were both trying to scan for her, but there she comes now. So she's going to walk pretty much straight towards where we are. There's a beautiful set of termite mounds actually here, or mounds of soil that were dumped after the excavation of the dam itself. And so I wonder if she might go and sit on top of there for us and pose quite nicely. It would be nice if she did. Just stopping behind the vegetation. A little twitch of the tail almost indicates that maybe she spotted something. See that little tail is twitching slightly, so I wonder if maybe she's seen something up ahead. This kind of vegetation is the perfect place for little dikers and steenbocks to be sitting at this time of the night. Also scrub hairs will be slowly but surely coming out. Uh, she seems to not be too concerned about it and is just coming straight this direction. Let's just go forward. Now, she seems as though she's going to pop out in front of me. We're going to not have her for more than a probably, like I say, maybe two minutes or so. She's about to cross over the boundary. We're right on the cusp of Little Gowrie and Juma at the moment. So I just want to get around here so we can just get one last look at her before she does cross over and heads southwards. There we go. So there she is. You can see she's just kind of watching and on the brink of the Mulawati and this movement that she's doing now is going to take her right south and into Little Gauri itself. So we're going to probably lose her in the next, I would say, 30 seconds or so as she crosses southwards and out of our area. There she goes over the road. Well, down the road first a little bit and then over the road. It's not far from where we are now. But what a wonderful afternoon with Shadow. We've had a lovely time. It was worth the wait with her sleeping just to watch her kind of going about her business and that drink and everything like that. So really good to see her and, and hopefully we'll get more views of her like this and it'll be interesting to see Tandy's reaction over the next little bit. And so while we meander our way back towards home because we're right on the southern boundary, let's go back to Brent Leo Smith in the studio and find out what he's up to. Oh, there we go. The mystery skull is still here. It's looking quite scary, I won't lie. It's not looks like something you wouldn't want to put your finger in. Now, if you look carefully at the, at the dentition here, it is, it is quite different. So, I'm going to... Do you want my torch again, Craig? No, it's all good. No, it's cool. So, uh, no, I've been told by no, no, Batman does not want extra life. So, if we have a look, you see there's very, very prominent sort of molars and premolars and they're quite well worn down so this is an old animal but for me the most interesting thing is the is the canines so you see there's a lack of incisors there is a lack of incisors so on here we've just got the, the, the canines there are incisors on the bottom jaw but nothing on the top jaw I'm just want to have a quick look if they have fallen out no, they haven't. Now, that is a bit of a clue to what creature this might be. So it is, it is quite small. I know there was a lot of talk, it could be a carnivore. But if we look carefully at the teeth, it, it's definitely not a carnivore. So these teeth here, you can see, are probably designed for, well, okay, maybe occasionally on insects, but definitely more a, herb a herbivore's diet, a herbaceous diet. Um, but I still think these top canines are the coolest things because that is the little hint. And look at that. I mean, for the size of the skull, they are quite massive. Now, in its closest relative, which is a big hint, they are very oddly shaped and very, very specifically designed. Now, we've got a few answers coming through. Well, Janet says, is it a snake? Well, apparently I'm my, my, blocking my mic. Um, it is not a snake at all, Janet. Now, a snake would definitely eat this. So there we go. There is a black mamba. Who this would definitely fall within the prey of uh, the black mamba. Um, so there we go. You can see a snake skull, quite different. Janet says uh, a baby honey badger. It is not a honey badger indeed. We would have definite incisors in a honey badger skull. Um, now... Baba Ganoush says a jackal. It is definitely not a jackal. Um, those of you who've spent time with uh, with any of us in the tent, a jackal 
and back at Juma, we've got a jackal that was actually killed by quarantine, a piece of his skull there. It's got a very, very long, much, much elongated nose, and it is a much bigger animal. This is a very small animal, um, probably about the same size as a hare or a rabbit. Well, I think some of you have got it. There we go, Eric, spot on. It is indeed a hyrax, a screaming tree hyrax. Um, and they are, they are elephants' closest relative, and that's why you see this long, long um, up, two upper canines. Um, but yes, it is indeed a hyrax. And a big thank you to Nicola Austin, Austi, or uh, if you are Scott Dyson, Gorge, um, who sent this to us from Samburu. So a big thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Nicola. Here we go. So isn't that cool? A hyrax. Um, a tree hyrax, not, not, not a rock hyrax. Now, ooh, it's actually a bit gross, but I'll show you anyway because it is quite interesting. So you can actually see the palate, the skin of the palate is still there. It's quite dry. Um, I'm definitely going to have to wash my hands after this. Although, it smells a little bit, but it's not too bad. But there we go, a screaming tree hyrax, and that's quite apt that it's got stuck in, in, in the mouth open. Now, for us, the, the hyraxes, they are really, really cute. We do see them around camp from time to time, but they have the most irritating habit, and that is screaming. Um, I'm sure we've played, I don't know if I, I can't play for you from here, but I know Jamie has definitely played you the screaming hyrax. They start this, rawr, 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 and then, Wah! And that happens at 3 a.m. in the morning. And uh, for a lot of uh, people who come to Kenya for the first time, it is quite scary. This sounds like someone's being murdered at 3 a.m. Meanwhile, it's just a fluffy hyrax proclaiming his territory. Now, and let's go to someone else who maybe wakes up from time to time, or I do, from the screaming hyrax, and that is Jamie. <laughs> Completely, but I, I don't. I don't quite know what Brent said, but I assume it was something hilarious. So, for the last few minutes of the sunset safari, I don't know if I mentioned this. I don't think I did. Maybe I did. The other night, I was on my way home, and we saw a water mongoose. Now, I know that they live around Juma. I've found their tracks before, and I've heard reports of people seeing them. And I thought maybe if we're really lucky in the last 60 seconds, we might just find one for you. This is where I saw it. So I thought I'd come back and double check and just search around here because a water mongoose would be a first, I think, for most of you on your mammal species list. But unfortunately, it does look as though tonight is not the night. I'll keep searching right up until the bitter end, but it is time to do our goodbyes and I'll thank you. So, Jahawi, thank you very much. Awesome. I'm looking forward to heading across the river for three days tomorrow. A big thank you to Faith and to Megan in Juma, as well as to the rest of the South African crew. Of course, you know the drill. The biggest thank you always goes to the rest of you watching. Thank you for bearing with our dips and gremlins and all those sorts of things and weather-related troubles. Hopefully the weather holds out tomorrow morning. We shall see on the Sunrise Safari.